Hello, sons and daughters. Grab your grits and get ready for a wild ride through the darkest hollers of horror. This here compilation is gonna show ya things that'll make ya wish ya'd never wandered into these woods. Y'all ain't ready for what's waiting for ya. I had hiked in 15 miles to an alpine wilderness and just laid down for the night when a youngish guy in shorts and no bag pops out and asks me if I have water. I of course shared my water. He immediately said he had been hiking since yesterday. Apparently him and his friend went way back and off trail, skirting some cliffs along the way. Then he just says half jokingly, yeah, his brains are everywhere. I laughed half acidly. But he was sending off a really deadly vibe, not dangerous, just stone-cold shock. I asked him to clarify that last part, and offered him food and a cigarette. I also ordered him to sit down. He didn't want to because he would lose his legs if he sat now. But I explained he needed to sit a while. Long story short, his friend slipped and fell, and when he hit, his head popped, and then his body got wedged in a crevice. The guy I was talking to had spent all the previous day hiking around the cliff to find his friend, then had to hike out of the valley up the ridge and down again, all on Taylor slope off trail. He was absolutely shredded, skinned, tore up. He was begging me to come with him and help me get his friend out of the hill. That's the part that really stuck with me. He got up and was about three feet into the bush when I grabbed him gently and said, Hey, I got a phone. We'll see if emergency service works. Somehow it did, and I have zero idea how, technically or otherwise. We were standing in a glacial cratered alpine lake 15 miles from the trailhead. I got rescue up there, and man, I was super impressed with their response. Within a few hours, the first group of volunteers were passing my camp. These guys all looked like supermen, and they were. All night afterwards, a constant stream of rescue volunteers. I stayed camp and made a comfy spot for them to rest on the way down. They had to wait up there in white-out conditions for six nights, but rather than leave, they kept a constant vigil over the hiker's dead body. When the weather broke, a chopper flew in and took them all out. I've never been so deeply moved and impressed with that kind of selflessness in something we regard as a hobby, a sport, words that take away the very dangerous nature of it. Read all these stories and it seems most are deaths by slip and fall. Happens too easy. Don't take the chance with your life. I've always been a pragmatic man. I didn't believe in tales spun around campfires or the whispers of shadows that live in the corners of one's eyes. I was a straightforward guy, a military man who enjoyed a good beer and didn't bother much with the supernatural. I was from Spain, but had moved to the States as a kid. I went to high school here, joined the military, and ended up stationed near the border. My Spanish came in handy, and I would often cross the border into Mexico. It was in Mexico that I met her, the woman who would become my wife. Back then, she was just my girlfriend, a beautiful enigma who I was just beginning to unravel. Her father was an enigmatic man himself, a drafting teacher at a local college and a firm believer in the paranormal. I thought he was crazy with his talks about UFOs and death. But he asked me one day if I believed in death. I told him we were all going to die. He clarified, no, the actual grim reaper. Do you believe in it? I laughed it off, thinking he was just trying to rattle me. But he was serious. My girlfriend, now my wife, was quiet as her father asked me what I would think if he showed me a picture of death itself, the grim reaper. I didn't know what to make of it. My girlfriend just smiled at me or... Her mother chimed in from the kitchen, and I was sitting there in a foreign country with people I barely knew, thinking I was caught in some bizarre horror film. He offered to show me the picture, and despite my growing apprehension, I agreed. He returned with pictures, postcard, sized and flipped over. He began to explain how these pictures came into his possession. 
A friend of his who owned a camera shop had called him urgently one day. A man had brought in a picture of his brother on his deathbed taken in the 40s or 50s. He wanted the picture restored, and when the picture was blown up during the restoration process, the grim reaper was visible at the foot of the bed. My heart pounded in my chest as he finally flipped the pictures over. What I saw was just as he described. The man lying on the bed, the flowers by his side, and there at the foot of his bed was the figure. A dark robe with no connection to the ground, skeletal fingers clutching a stick, a skull peeking out from beneath a hood and the stick topped with a sickle. I felt a chill run down my spine. My blood turned to ice and I had to look away. I couldn't sleep for days after that. I was stationed in a barracks on a base and every time I closed my eyes I saw the picture. My friends noticed my unrest and when I told them the story they didn't believe me. I even invited some of them over to Mexico to see the picture and they were as shaken as I was. To this day I can't forget that picture and I haven't seen it since. The Grim Reaper was real to me in that moment, as real as the picture that I held in my hands. I had been a skeptic, but that experience shook me to my core. It was a window into a world that I had chosen to ignore, a world that was as real as the one I lived in. It was a chilling reminder of our mortality, and it was a memory that would haunt me for the rest of my life. Last night, there was a storm that hit Alabama. It started raining really hard around 4 p.m. and started getting really bad around 5 and 6 p.m. There was a tornado that hit Jefferson County, if I recall correctly. So before all that, at around 2.30 p.m., I went outside to feed the dogs when I got a text message from my sister. Hey, my battery died again. I'm at the water plant. My sister's car battery sucks. There's a water plant not far from here, so she pulled over. I got there, boosted her battery, and she went home. I wanted to go to the store, get some chips. Now my road is extremely backwoods. When you're on my road, it's like driving in a forest. I got some chips and headed back home, and by this time it's 3.15. It's starting to get cloudy, dark, and some rain. At 3.30, I was finally almost home just going through all these crazy turns. It's pretty common to see a deer or two pop up, so I was driving around 25 miles per hour around this curve. When I saw this thing, it moved ran like a monkey, was naked like a person, blue pale skin, long limbs, short body, a small skull, not too small, just small enough it didn't look like it belonged. If, if we're to stand, I would believe it to be about six foot tall, maybe a little shorter. I slammed on my brakes, but by the time I came to a stop, it had already ran into the woods. It didn't look at me, it just ran. Got home, told my sister. She thinks I'm pulling a joke on her. I'm just like I have last night, and today I'm still not sure what the hell I saw. I like to hunt. I got guns, but I'm not brave enough to find out what it is. Does anyone have any idea what that was? This was in North Alabama. Is anyone from around here that's seen it? I don't know if I'll ever see it again, but if I do, I'll post again. If I see it again, I'll try to take a picture. In late September 2002, I was camping by myself near Williamson River Campground. The area where I camp is one of many traditional campsites used by members of the Klamath tribes along the river. On my way in, I drove through the nearby campgrounds to see if any were occupied. As they were not, I continued on to my camp, confident that I would not be disturbed for at least one night. After setting camp, I caught my dinner, ate and settled in for a relaxing evening with my fire. It was very dark still, a little chilly and very quiet that night. I remember considering turning in for the night as my fire had burned down to embers, so I checked the time. It was midnight, exactly. 
At that moment, I heard a large and heavy object hit the surface of the water with tremendous force. I would estimate the distance of the splash to be about 30 feet away from my fire pit. The object came from the opposite side of the river. The object did not dislodge and roll down the bank as I would have heard it tumble down into the water. Also, the bank is such that if this large object were thrown by a human, it would have struck the bank at least once before reaching the river. Whatever threw this object, I determined to be a large rock, was very strong. I became immediately alarmed, realizing that I was not alone. I did not allow my instinct to flee, drive my to panic, although I was very frightened. I rationalized it could be one of two things that threw the rock. Sasquatch or a very large wild person. In either case, it was apparent to me that I wasn't welcome there that night even though I had camped there many times before without incident. I decided the best thing to do was to leave as quickly as possible. Before moving from my seat, I reached for my sidearm and fired around into the air to let whatever it was know that I was armed and scared. I then hurried to my vehicle started the engine and illuminated the opposite river bank with my roof-mounted spotlight. I saw nothing. I then quickly broke camp and left without further incident. I did retrieve the object in question a couple of weeks ago. It is a large volcanic rock of awkward shape and weighs in at 34 pounds. It was exactly where I remember hearing the splash and is the only rock of that size and shape in that section of the river. I never considered myself an ordinary man. Roy Anderson, a dedicated family man and an avid hunter, was my name. Each year, as the vibrant colors of autumn painted the landscape, I eagerly awaited the time, honored tradition shared with my hunting friend. We would embark on a thrilling excursion into the depths of unknown woods to pursue the elusive deer, testing our skills and strengthening the bonds of friendship. This year, our chosen destination was a secluded forest nestled in the Appalachian Mountains, renowned for its haunted past and tales of missing persons. The air was thick with anticipation as we gathered our gear and set out, our hearts pounding with a mix of excitement and trepidation. The stories we had heard about the forest's dark history only fueled our desire for adventure. As we delved deeper into the forest, surrounded by towering trees and enveloped in an eerie silence, a sense of unease began to seep into our souls. Unbeknownst to us, we had inadvertently strayed into uncharted territory, a place shrouded in mystery and inhabited by an unknown force. It started subtly with whispers on the wind and fleeting shadows that danced at the edge of our vision. But soon, the malevolence lurking in the depths of the woods made its presence known. The forest seemed to awaken, vibrating with an otherworldly energy. Fear coursed through our veins as we realized we had become prey in this dark game. And then we saw it, the cryptid, a creature that defied explanation, with six legs and standing at a towering height of eleven feet. It appeared as a monstrous hybrid, combining the ferocity of a mountain lion with the raw power of a bear. Its presence was both mesmerizing and terrifying as its eyes glowed with a sinister intelligence. The forest became a battleground, the thrill of the hunt replaced by the desperate struggle for survival. Each of us fought valiantly, but the cryptid seemed to possess an uncanny ability to anticipate our moves, as if it were toying with us. We realized that our only chance lay in confronting this formidable adversary head-on. In the final moments of our harrowing encounter, I found myself face to face with the cryptid, Determination surged through my veins as I summoned all my strength to deal a decisive blow. I struck, unleashing a mighty attack. The cryptid let out an agonizing roar, and I believe victory was within our grasp. But the moment was fleeting. As I fought to maintain consciousness, the world blurred around me. When I finally awoke, the sun was beginning its descent, casting an orange glow upon the forest. Panic gripped my heart as I frantically searched for any trace of the cryptid's body, but it was gone, 
vanished without a trace. Confusion and disbelief clouded my mind as I pieced together the fragments of what had transpired. How had I survived? What had become of the cryptid? The forest offered no answers, its secrets buried within its ancient gnarled trees. Now I am left with an unforgettable tale to tell, a haunting reminder of the unseen forces that lurk in the depths of the unknown. A buddy and myself rode our bikes up the road to check out the old helicopter pad which we had been told of by our neighbors. As we got the top, we heard hard stomping, almost like there was the different animals up there with us. About ten feet from us, we heard a loud crack, and then a madrone tree started to shake violently. The It stopped, then again the tree shook. My firing and I thought it was a joke. So we picked up our rocks and started to throw them in the general direction of the tree. We scared it off for a little while, but then the tree stared to shack and a rock was thrown back. We decided to jet fearing a bear or something else. As we rode down the road, we could hear one on each side of the road, stomping almost like chasing us out of the forest. I have been up there four times since then and find it imposable for the tree to shake as it did. But since then, I have had two more encounters with the stomping beast in that general area. Last day of a week, long backpacking trip in the Canadian Rockies. I was about 15 minutes ahead of Dan when I came upon a literally steaming pile of grisly scat in the middle of the trail loaded with berries. I made sure that my bear spray was handy and walked on. Maybe 30, 40 yards down, I was in some brush when I heard a rustling to my right. I stopped, grabbed the bear spray in my camera. Then a grizzly, eight, ten feet tall, stood up on its hind legs less than ten feet from me. But just as quickly it dropped down and ran off like a quarter horse and disappeared. I got a bad photo and a racing heart. I was getting home late with my older sister. Uh, I'll call her Sarah. It, it was around 10, 10, 30. My parent told us to go grab some things from the backyard as a windstorm was coming. For reference, we lived in a trailer park at the time, and there was a giant hill in our backyard that hit a power plant. I always hated going in the backyard at night because there was no light. Sarah said she thought she heard a noise, but we assumed it was our dad. Sarah called Dad and our dad came out of the house. We didn't panic because there were stray cats everywhere that could have made that noise. Our dad went inside, and we started towards the door, and I stopped when I saw a deer-like figure run on its hind legs to the hill. I wouldn't have thought much of it if we lived by woods or something, but we lived in a trailer in the middle of a super-populated town. My sisters saw it too, and we could never figure out what it was. I just recently learned about skinwalkers and don't know much about them, but think this could possibly be one. Any opinions? I was staying at my uncle's house in India in the country for the summer. He was gone for the summer, so I was house-sitting. A lot of weird shit happened over those couple months, and I have no explanation. Weirdest of them all was the one I'm about to tell you. It was monsoon season, so the power was going out a lot. He had a room situated in the back of the house on top of a garage I was staying in. It was not connected to the house, so I didn't have an inverter. So on to the story. One night, the heavy wind came around Nightmum and the power went with me. So I decided to go into the house and go to the room that had power. No ache, but a fan is better than nothing. At the time, I had a set of DVDs of The Sopranos and was watching it on my laptop. This shit still gives me the freaks. But I went into house, locked the door behind me, went into the room, turned on the fan, and then the light. The light turned on and then flickers and burns out. I didn't give anything to that because I had this huge flashlight with me anyways. 
So I go to the bed and turn on The Sopranos. The Sopranos is a really good show, so my mind was completely focused on that. Nothing could bother me, but then out of nowhere, I heard something I have no answer for. Somebody or something was in the house. Sounded like the smacking of slippers on your feet while somebody walks around. It happened right across the room's door, too, so it scared the shit out of me because I thought somebody might gotten inside. But I remember locking the doors, so I was confused. Took my flashlight and decided to go with the sword in the room and yelled, saying, whomever is to there, come out. You got one chance. Nothing but silence and the sound of the fan from my room. Remember, this is India. Robberies happen quite a bit out in the village and people will kill you. That's no joke, so I was scared to death. As I'm about to leave the room, I hear the fridge in the kitchen turn on and the power's back and the house was completely empty. Also, the doors were still locked. Still have no idea what that was. But after this strange shit started to occur, like faucets running in rooms that I wasn't using, but I also don't believe in this stuff, so it never really bothered me afterwards because the power did go out again the next couple of days, and I went back to that room still. I am an avid outdoorsman and I have a few stories for you folks that are from my past experiences. I'm going to start with one from a few years ago. I was on a hunting trip with my dad on some land I owned in a very desolate part of a neighboring county, perfect right. Well, here is what happened. We get to the access road, albeit it was more of a logging trail from days gone by, but my 4x4 could handle it. So we get to the stopping point of the access and park the truck. I'm getting ready to get out when Dad decides we need to stay at the truck for a bit. He said something along the lines of not having a flashlight, when in reality he wanted a bit more sleep, fine, whatever, right. After about 30 minutes, I couldn't wait anymore, so I woke him up and we proceeded to get ready. Dad had just put his gun over his shoulder when we heard a blood-curling scream off in the distance that put us both on edge. I was ready to leave, but Dad talked me into going on our way. He assumed it was just a bobcat or a fox. I was nervous, but I was also carrying a 36 with 220 grain loads and a 45, so I figured I could handle myself if need be, plus Dad was armed as well. So we hit out, and we made about a 400-yard hike when we saw it. It being a deer with its entire throat ripped out and blood everywhere we quickly but carefully left the area guns down and loaded. I have personally seen coyotes attack a deer, and going for the throat isn't there. Well, they go for the quarters and drag a deer down. The only thing we can come up with is a big cat of some sort, although mountain lions no longer live in the area due to overhunting or at least that's what we have always understood to be true. I don't believe in Bigfoot or the like, but moments like that really make you wonder. While working on the Riceland Rail Facility, I had gotten stuck in a patch of mud after some light rain the day before. I was surprised that the mud was different from the rest of the dirt road and went back to investigate why I got stuck. Upon walking to the mud patch, I noticed something that didn't belong. Sticking up out the mud was huge bone. Its color was something I knew, just a gut instinct was human. I collected it up and reported it to the company safety, saying that I believe it was human, and upon a quick Google search, deemed it highly likely to be a human femur bone. After a couple of days, I was curious as to why police never showed up and if it was turned over to the proper authorities. He said he just chucked it out his buggy on the way to the foreman's office. Said it would have seriously delayed the project and that the Bayou's held a bunch of mysteries. Said that the reason the mud was so soft was that they had dump trucks bring in more fill dirt to level the road and that a bunch of bodies go missing into the bayou. I was shaken as I was not from the area and torn between my morals and wanting to make it home in one piece. There was a bunch of stories of people working there tied into the mafia and people finding bodies in the bayous all the time.
Even once had a neo-Nazi come up to my work truck to explain that there was a gas line not marked via traditional GPS surveys. I told him I wasn't the guy and that the office was down the road a bit. I called my mom for advice and she said that I had to do what I have to just to make it home for my wife and kids. My friend Mel and I were up panning for gold. He was on the left side of the road and I decided to walk up a small stream on the right side to see if I could find anything. I was about 75 yards and standing on a log that had crossed the stream taking a rest when I smelled a musty smell and the hair stood up on the back of my neck. I turn around to see something take one step in the middle of an eight feet stream and to the other side. It was six, seven feet tall, brown and black, longer arms with slight hump back. At that time, I unholstered my sidearm and put a round in the chamber. I just stood there for a couple of minutes trying to see or hay or anything to no avail. I slowly made my way back to the road through the thick brush the same way I'd come in and told Mel what I had seen. He didn't know what to think. I have been in the mountains my whole life and not seen anything remotely close to what I'd seen that day, although I've smelled the same musty smell on other occasions while out in the bush. There were three of us, Mary Jane Robinson, her mother Dorothy Robinson, and myself. We were in rural Pennsylvania. Shippensburg in Cumberland County. We went shopping in a mall that was a few miles from home. Mary was getting ready to go to nursing school. She was buying a few things, and uh, the stores closed at 9 p.m. We were coming back from Shippensburg, and Mary hated driving on Interstate 80, one, so we always took the rural back roads. It was a perfectly clear night, a million stars visible in some moonlight. And it was just, you know, a lovely drive. Then, out of nowhere, there were these lights that came up behind us, and Mary thought that somebody wanted to pass. So she put her arm out, and she said, pass, pass. And she slowed down, and they didn't pass. But they were close, and it was annoying her. So she stopped the car, and she said, I want to find out what is going on. And her mother said, Mary, don't get out of this car. Just stop. Let them go. Ignore them. And she said, no, maybe something's wrong. Ever the caregiver, Nurse Mary. I was in the back seat. I got out of the car as well. Mary was 18 and I was 14. So I got out of the car also and I was on the passenger side of the car. Mary was on the driver's side of the car. She walked to the rear of the car and I was already pretty much there. And there was this object. There was no lights this time. When we stopped and got out of the car, the lights were gone. And you couldn't even see where there had been headlights or anything. It was perfectly smooth. It wasn't square. It wasn't like oblong or like a hot dog or anything like that. It sort of had a rise in the center from the top as though it rose and the bottom appeared to be flat and the sides were curved, but very smooth. There was not a sound at all, Mr. Bell. Not an engine, not a hum, not a nothing. It was absolutely quiet. Art asks if she was frightened. No, because we didn't feel threatened. I mean, I actually touched it. I was so fascinated with it because I didn't know what it was made of. In later years, I came to realize that it was like titanium. It was perfectly black and the moonlight made it look shiny. A starts rushing her as always, asking if they took off or whatever. No, we did not take off. Mary starts asking, Hello, do you want to talk to us? I'm not afraid. And I said, I'm not afraid either. I said, would you like to speak to us? Would you like to ask us questions? We'd like to uh, answer your questions. Don't be afraid. We're not afraid. We were kids, you know. Now Mary's mother is in the front seat crying hysterically. Get in the car. Get in the car. I I don't like this. I'm frightened. And Mary's just, Ma, shut up. 
This is the thing that was amazing. It just lifted straight up without making a sound. It just elevated as if to go up, and while it was right in front of I mean, I wasn't a foot from it, and I could put my arm out and touch it, and it just lifted straight up and just sort of took off. And as it took off, lights around it started circling, different colors, and we could see people inside, and we waved. We waved goodbye. Art ass. Human or non-human? They were too far away, but they appeared to be human. They had heads, necks, shoulders, arms, and the one thing that Mary said was, they don't have five fingers. And see, I wasn't looking at the fingers. And, um, we were waving to them, saying goodbye, and they waved back to us. I was archery hunting here in Virginia at our hunt club, set up on top of a ridge with a lot of buck sign, about 20 feet off the ground. I hear something coming up the ridge from a swampy area. Here comes a mama black bear and three cubs. So was a big mature sow. She walks right to the base of the tree. I'm sitting in and stops dead and starts looking around. Obviously caught a whiff of where I walked in. So she stops, and the cubs, of course, are oblivious to what is going on. The cubs start playing on the tree. I'm in, and I'm, I'm thinking one of them is going to climb the tree. Not good. Now I'm starting to think I'm in deep dew. If a cub climbs the tree and starts bawling or something, so one of the little dudes gets on its hind legs, paws on the tree. Now I'm thinking I may have to take the saw, even though I don't want to. Bears are in season, but still. Just about that time, feel a little breeze, which lets the soul catch a whiff of me. Hair stands up on her back. She wheels around and woofs, heading back the way she came, with the startled cubs tagging behind her. To set things up, me, 19 female, and my boyfriend, 26 male, both have extensive experience in the woods. I hiked across the Pacific Trail from Ashland to the Bridge of the Gods at the border of Washington, and that took six weeks. I've always enjoyed the outdoors, and I've never felt unsafe even when getting close to wildlife such as bears. My boyfriend grew up in a rural area surrounded by farmland, so he's also comfortable with the outdoors. We decided to go camping at a lake, which is about 45 minutes away from Yakima, Washington, and this region of Washington has an abundance of Native American land, history, and Native people, of course. Not sure if it's relevant, but I, I, I thought I'd add it. We end up getting to the lake at about 10.45 p.m. As we pull into the entrance, I immediately get a bad feeling. I have only felt something like this a handful of times in my entire life. I tell my boyfriend, basically, this place is giving me a bad vibe. Man, and he says, I'm just scared of the dark, utterly dismissing my feeling. As we round a curve, I'm struck with the reality that I've had a dream about this place. His car... A Crown Victoria, the specific shape of the road, the light from his headlights. It wasn't deja vu. It was straight out of a dream I had when I was maybe 12 years old. I tell my boyfriend I've dreamt about this place, everything about it. I go into more detail than that, but you get the idea. In my dream, there was a pale, creepy face with reflective eyes staring at me through the trees, and I just remember running as fast as I can from it down the road. Again, he considers what I'm saying, but ultimately disregards it. We pull up to the campsite and set up pretty fast. Maybe 15 minutes and we've got our tent up, a fire going, and my boyfriend has a cigar lit since he's terribly addicted to the nasty things. As we sit around the campfire, he's puffing away, and suddenly we hear this wildly loud screaming. It sounded like a group of college kids screaming their drunken asses off, but it didn't sound quite right, if that makes sense. It sounded like men and women screaming in perfect unison, the high and low screams melding together. I instantly try to rationalize the strange sound. It was maybe a mile away, just over a hill, possibly. 
Moments later, we hear it again, but on the opposite direction, and it's closer, now probably a half a mile away. I swear to God it sounded more disturbing, realizing that sound is not human at all. I don't know if it was more distorted and alien, or if the proximity allowed me to hear it better. We begin to quietly discuss how that sound is not normal. Neither of us in all of our years of hiking and traveling have ever heard something remotely like that. Moments later, the sound is not further than a football field away. My boyfriend puts his cigar down, grabs his gun, and we agree to ignore it and no longer speak of it for the rest of the night. We hop in our tent and wake up to a gorgeous sunny day. His cigar was missing that next morning. We talked about it a bit that day, and it still freaks us out thinking about it. I believe that when it sounded far away, it was actually very close. These creatures have an ability to sound far away, when really, they're not far at all. I heard from some people that the further they sound, the closer they are. Thoughts, feelings, opinions, story is 100% real, by the way. My friends and I like to go camping when there's a lot of snow out because it's just different and really isn't too bad, as long as you know how to pack for snow and properly layer. Another reason we really like to go then is because there's so few people and we like to shoot guns and the less people there, the less complications that go with that. With that, he'll explain what happened. Myself and two of my friends, we will just refer to them as Chris and Dean, went out to find a spot to park our vehicles and hike out a bit in the snow to find a spot to camp up on a mountain that was just past the southern part of Rimrock Lake, past the airport a bit. We find a spot that is clear of snow that snowmobilers use to park their trucks and unload their snowmobiles. From there, we see a trail that doesn't look like it has deep snow. So we decide to go down it a bit and see if we can get closer to the mountain, since it would be a lot less walking. We make it about halfway there and both Dean's Jeep and my truck get stuck and we can't get them out at all. We decide to go up the mountain a bit and see if we can get cell service so we can call Dean's uncle, since we knew he owned a recovery rig he built for the snow. We go up, bringing our rifles with us, and we come to a clearing with some piles of wood pallets. Dean's phone gets service and he calls his uncle and said he can come help us out, but probably won't be until morning since he's out of town that day. We tell him it's fine since we were staying the night anyway, so while we're just hanging out, we decide to staple some paper targets to the pallets to shoot at since it was a good area with a backstop to shoot. We shoot for about 30 minutes and hear a scream like you described, but it sounded pretty far away. Chris doesn't really camp that often, so he was commenting on how weird it was, and my, myself and Dean were like, uh, probably just snowmobilers around or something, even though we didn't see anyone near us at all. We keep going until it starts to get dusk, and we hear it again, and it sounded closer. We all kind of looked at each other, acknowledging that it was weird, and decided to head down to where the vehicles were stuck and set up camp there since Dean forgot his sleeping bag in the Jeep. We start walking down again, and the scream happened again, but in the opposite direction. We start to move a little bit quicker down the hill and get to our vehicles and start setting up tents and everything. We're in the middle of that when the scream happened again, but sounded close as fake. We all stop and look at each other and decide to grab our rifles and look around. At this point, it's pretty dark, so we really couldn't see much, but myself and Chris had weapon-mounted flashlights on our rifles, so we just turned them on and started scanning the area, but didn't see anything out of the ordinary. After that, we didn't hear it again. Next day, Dean's uncle came out and pulled us out of the snow. We tell him the story. He's been going there for like 30-plus years, and he said very nonchalantly, yeah, that shit happens. I don't know what it could be, but that's why I just bring a high-power rifle. L-O-L. I, I heard screams like that before, but I always thought it was just people partying in the woods since it always happened in the spring or summer. 
It happening in the winter when there is feet of snow was spooky since there really isn't a lot of people that camp out there during that time. Since then, it's made me rethink if it really is just people partying in the woods or something else. I don't know what it could be, but it is very strange, and like I said at the beginning, I just chalk it up to the woods or just spooky like that LOL. I live in a very small town in Kansas, and last night I woke up to every dog in the town barking. Then all of a sudden something started making a noise like I've never heard before, and all the dogs got quiet. This thing sounded like it was three or four blocks away, and then within a second it sounded like it was in my backyard. I could hear it moving outside my house. Then it would sound like it was blocks away again, and it just kept repeating the howl it was making. It kept doing this for about 15 minutes. My friends and I decided to meet up for a casual chat in the park one afternoon. We were strolling through the woods, enjoying the fresh air and the sounds of nature when we came across some abandoned toilet. At first, we didn't think much of it. It was just another sign of urban decay, a forgotten structure lost in the midst of the woods. However, as we walked around to the back of the toilets, we saw something that made our hearts stop. Through the blurry glass, we could see what looked like a figure, an arm, and a hand dangling in the air. It appeared as if someone had hanged themselves, or worse, been hanged. It was a terrifying sight, one that instantly filled us with fear. We stood frozen in shock for a moment before deciding we needed a second opinion. We didn't want to jump to conclusions, but we couldn't ignore what we were seeing either. Spotting a passerby, we quickly called him over and asked him to take a look. We wanted to confirm if we were just hallucinating or if there was genuinely something there. To our growing horror, he saw the same thing. His daughter, who had been trailing behind him, also saw the same chilling sight. At their suggestion, we decided to report the matter to the police. The seriousness of the situation was sinking in, and we knew we needed to act responsibly. We quickly made our way to the local police station, where we gave them our details and explained the situation. They assured us they would send an officer to the location as soon as possible. As we left the police station, we couldn't shake off the eerie feeling. We had gone out for a simple meet up a walk in the park and ended up stumbling upon something so chilling. The image was burnt into our minds, and the fear was still palpable. I promise to keep everyone updated as soon as we hear back from the police. We can only hope now that it's not what we fear it is. It was a typically quiet morning when I got a call from Jeannie, a resident who lived about 30 miles up to El Boulevard. I've known Jeannie for years. We grew up together in the same small town, and she's always been the type to keep to herself. So when I heard her voice trembling over the phone, I knew something was wrong. Something's been here in my driveway, she stammered, her voice shaky. A huge footprint in the mud. My brows furrowed in confusion. A footprint, Jeannie? I echoed, trying to comprehend what she was saying. Yes, it's... it's massive. I ain't seen anything like it before. I assured her I would be there soon and quickly set off in my truck, driving the familiar route up D.L. Boulevard as I turned up Boundary Road, my mind raced with possibilities. Could it be a bear? But Jeannie's house was a fair distance from the forest's edge. Perhaps some prankster is trying to give her a scare. Pulling up the driveway, I saw Jeannie standing there, her face pale and her eyes wide with fear. She led me to the footprint, and my heart skipped a beat. There, embedded in the mud, was an enormous footprint. It was much larger than any human foot, and it had a peculiar shape that was distinctly non-human. The toes were long and had sharp, claw-like protrusions at the tips. The heel was broader than any creature's foot I had seen. I knelt down beside it, my mind racing. I had been working as a park ranger for over ten years, and I had seen all sorts of animal tracks. But this, this was different. This was something I had never seen before. 
As I traced my fingers over the imprint, I felt a shiver run down my spine. Whatever had left this footprint was huge and potentially dangerous. It was my duty to find out what it was and ensure the safety of the residents. In the following days, I led a team of experts to examine the footprint. We cast a plaster mold of it, hoping to identify the creature that had wandered so close to human habitation. We searched the nearby woods, looking for any signs of this unknown creature. But all we found were more questions. The footprint became a local mystery. Some said it was a hoax. Others believed it was a creature from local legend. But for me, it was a reminder of the unknown that still exists in our world, a mystery that I am yet to solve. Every day as I patrol the woods, I keep my eyes open, wondering if I'll come across another such footprint, hoping that one day I'll come face to face with a creature that left it behind. In the heart of a vast and untouched forest, a group of three young hikers embarked on an adventurous journey. Their backpacks weighed them down, but their spirits were high with anticipation. Each hiker possessed a unique personality that set them apart. There was Mark, the outgoing and fearless leader of the group. His rugged appearance matched his adventurous nature, and he wore a determined look on his face as he navigated through the dense foliage. By his side was Sarah, a nature enthusiast with a gentle spirit. Her bright eyes sparkled with curiosity as she soaked in the beauty of the surroundings. Finally, there was Alex, the mischievous and carefree joker of the group. Always up for a thrill, he added a light-hearted touch to their excursions. As they trekked deeper into the forest, fate led them to an unexpected discovery a long-forgotten Cherokee Native American burial ground. The air hung heavy with a sense of sacredness, and whispers of warning seemed to echo through the trees. Local tribesmen, led by an elder known as Sitting Owl, had long guarded this resting place, cautioning outsiders to show respect and avoid disturbing the spirits that dwelled there. Ignorant of the sacredness and disregardful of the warnings, the hikers succumbed to the lure of mischief. In their inebriated state, they thoughtlessly disrupted the tranquility of the burial ground, defiling it with their disrespectful actions. Night fell, casting an eerie veil over the forest. The hikers, seeking refuge from the darkness, stumbled upon an abandoned Native American cabin hidden amidst the trees. Unbeknownst to them, the cabin had its own dark history intertwined with the curse of the disturbed burial ground. As the moonlight filtered through the cracks in the cabin's wooden walls, the atmosphere grew increasingly sinister. Unseen forces stirred, awakened by the desecration of the sacred ground. The hiker's presence had unleashed an ancient curse that sought to exact its vengeance upon those who trespassed. One by one, the hikers began to succumb to strange and inexplicable afflictions. Mark, the fearless leader, was struck by a sudden and debilitating stroke that left him paralyzed and helpless. Sarah, the nature enthusiast, convulsed violently, vomiting a black, viscous substance before succumbing to a suffocating darkness. Alex, the carefree joker, inexplicably lost his sight stumbling blindly and meeting a tragic end when he fell upon the sharp blades of a long-forgotten garden rake. The next morning, sitting out with a mix of sorrow and anger, arrived at the scene. His eyes surveyed the tragic aftermath, and he exhaled a heavy sigh. Strangers should stay away from our burial grounds. He uttered a stern warning laced with sadness. The price of their disrespect had been paid in blood, and the spirits of the ancient Cherokee ancestors had taken their vengeance. In my twenties, my dumbass went camping near Hagerman, Idaho, at a little gravel beach spot right off the Snake River. It was myself, my fiancé, and his best friend. They stayed up a little too late Friday night, and I woke up a little too early Saturday morning. 
Bored, I hiked up through some large boulders on the side of a rocky cliff that was about 300 feet so I could watch the sunrise. It was a cool July morning, 50s, so I didn't bring more than a small bottle of water, not realizing the desert heats up way faster than you'd ever imagine once that sun hits the horizon. Within 40 minutes of the sun coming up, I decide that it's hitting 70 plus degrees already and time to head back. Going down was going to be more precarious because there wasn't exactly a trail. Also with the heat came the rattlesnakes, hundreds of them, not just one or two, but literally slithering out and curling up goddamned everywhere in the crevices between the rocks. I didn't have a stick or way to gently coerce them to move, so I had no option but to get onto the boulders and do my best to hop from rock to rock without killing myself or provoking them. I've never seen or expected so many snakes in one area, but with so little water, no sun cream on, and the mid-July desert waiting to dehydrate me to oblivion. Stopping was not an option. My campmates were sleeping off a boozy night and wouldn't hear me call for help, even if I'd tried. I've never been bothered by snakes in the past, but the scene in Indiana Jones and the Lost Ark came swimming to mind with a brand new appreciation. It took me about 90 minutes to get up the cliff and about four hours of precarious leaps to get back down. I finally hit safety around 9.30 a.m. and vowed at that point to never do stupid shit like that again. Mother Nature is metal, and she'll remind you she's the boss every single time. Okay, so in 2006, when I first started working at Walmart at 20, I used to walk several miles home every day down a long highway. Every now and then, I used to get picked up by people who were very nice and saw I was suffering out in the heat in the middle of summer with my shirt off and just a wife beater on. Well, one day a guy picks me up and seems cool at first, but then he started telling me how he is a modeling agent and was looking for talent. He asked if that was something I was interested in, and I wasn't sure but was wondering where this was going. He started asking me if I have body hair on my body, which I answered until he started asking if I had any hair on my ass and other private places. At this point, the danger alarms were ringing in my head, and I just wanted to get out of that car extremely fast. I asked him to drop me off at some random neighborhood that was about 20 minutes from where I live, and I just walked into the staircase and waited about 15 miles to make sure he wasn't around and couldn't follow me home. And then I walked home, looking over my shoulder the whole way. To this day, it freaks me out, the vibes the guy gave me. I felt that if I didn't get out of that car, I, I was never going to make it home. And I just realized I misread the op, and it's about hiking, not hitchhiking, lol. One... One, 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 one. When hiking at this shitty state park in East Texas, first of all, you drive down this long dirt road past a cemetery where they're having funerals. Then when you finally find the unmarked parking lot, you can see the buzzards all over. Walk down to the lake and the smell of rotting dead animal is overpowering. Buzzards everywhere. Bones everywhere. Finally, you can hear the ranch nearby upstream shooting, and I put it all together. These assholes were shooting varmints and throwing them in the part of the river or creek that would wash them into the lake. The carcasses would eventually wash on shore and rot or be eaten by buzzards. Buzzard shit, rotting meat, and bones everywhere. Not really a hiker, but I live in the woods, and occasionally you see weird shit. You'd be shocked at how often bucks will try to jump or run through a tree at full gallop, with two shoots from one root, think of up, shape, and instantly break their neck or get stuck with their horns past the tree but can't squeeze out. They either die immediately and are propped up by the tree or slowly starve in that position. The bottom line is... It's not exactly rare to stumble across what looks like a rotting deer standing between two trees. 
especially along paths, uh, game trails where predators will chase them. Another fun, creepy thing with deer, that's probably related to the above, is chronic wasting disease, mad cow, or UCJD for deer. I swear it literally turns deer into walking zombies with giant wounds showing internal organs, rotting necrotic tissue, gross hanging off them, milky eyes, etc. In other words, the full animal zombie experience. It's incredibly infectious without predators to cull them, so it's affecting whole herds of deer. If you decide to Google it, do it on an empty stomach. Seriously, it's that nasty. I've heard stories and seen videos of bucks literally bashing their heads to pulp on rocks until they're dead. It rots their brain and weakens them so much they just kind of go on autopilot and do all kinds of context-inappropriate deer things. I was camping in Rock Quarry the night before we were going to rock climb. The kids were shooting a bottle rockets in the quarry for about an hour. Then we were all standing around fire, just talking, when all of a sudden this loud scream came from the top northwest side of the quarry. At fist we just stood there looking at each other, kind of wondering what in the world, what just screamed. I asked John, my friend, who has been an avid outdoorsman his whole life, if he had ever heard something like that before, and he said he didn't know what it could be. Then there was another scream, but it was more intense, and it seemed closer this time. At this point, my oldest son went and locked himself in my pickup truck. The screaming went on for a good ten minutes at least. We were just standing there by the fire, amazed at what we were hearing. I had been videoing the boys with my camcorder, and I didn't even think to turn it on at all. I wish I would have now. The screaming finally ended, and we didn't know what it was, and just kind of talked for a while longer and went to bed. Later on, I awoke to hear some far-off screams, and then they ended, and I fell back asleep. We really never talked much about it after that, until one night I was listening to some of the Bigfoot sounds on your page, and when a certain sound came up, the hair on my neck stood up. It was the exact same sound we heard that night in the rock quarry. To verify that I was hearing what I was hearing, I went and woke my son up and told him to come listen to this sound on the computer. I also told him not to look at the computer, but just listen to see if he recognized the sound. I clicked on the sound, and my son, after listening, immediately said, that's what we heard when we went camping at Rattlesnake, and that pretty much confirmed it for me. My opinion is it was Bigfoot. I have hunted and been in the woods my whole life, and have never heard something like that before, or probably will again. I regret not taping the sound, but who was to know? But I definitely believe. This lasted three nights in a row. The first night we were awakened by a very powerful scream. The only way I can describe it was it was like the sound of tires on the road coming to a screeching halt. Just like all the other Bigfoot stories, it was unlike anything I've ever heard, and I know it wasn't a bear, cougar, elk, etc. It was very loud and lengthy, and what caught my attention was it wasn't moving through the woods as a normal North American animal would. It was staying in one spot. It sounded to me like it was breaking tree limbs and rolling logs down a hill. This lasted about ten minutes or so, then it went away. This happened for the next two nights about the same time. But on days two and three, it kept moving farther and farther away. Needless to say, I was terrified, but also interested and curious. I was too scared to get out of my tent, so I just lied there and listened and hoped it wouldn't bother us. I was camping with my family at Timothy Lake. Late one night, we were awakened by people at nearby camps, yelling, saying that there was a bear or something outside. We then heard something running pretty fast. I can remember feeling the ground shake when its feet hit the ground. 
It ran not too far from our tent into the woods, and it sounded like it might have ran into a tree because we heard a loud bang and the sound of a tree cracking and falling. We aren't sure what it was, though. While sitting in the blazer, with three other females ranging in age from 1334, all of which were sleeping, that was broken down, waiting for help to return. I noticed on the east side that there seemed to be something peeking out from a tree, approximately twenty into the woods. I was thinking that it could have been a trick of lighting, and the wind moving some branches is the only time I seemed to be seeing movement was when I was looking straight ahead to the north the direction the blazer was headed, and this was out of the corner of my right eye to the east, and every time I would move my head to the right, it would stop. I played this game for a while, but decided that if I was really seeing something, that I was going to have to turn my head to the right. I dozed off for a while, and when I woke, I was still looking off to the right, east, and there was something peeking around a tree that was closer, more like fifteen feet or so, so I just kept my eyes on the object and was able to make out that it was tall, hairy, light coloring in the face except for the eye and mouth area. It didn't move, but just like a shifting of feet once in a while. It didn't advance any more, but seemed intent on watching what was going on or in seeing just what it was that it was looking at. I couldn't smell anything as the wind was blowing to the east. I didn't awake anyone because I didn't want to scare them. I didn't feel threatened. But I wasn't going to go and check it out either. At 3.30, help arrived, and so I concentrated on what needed to be done to get the broken-down rig off the hill. Also noticed, the footsteps that were heard were further down the hill, closer to the second split in the logging road. I don't have any more detail other than what I already said about that part. Other witnesses, there were four of us up on the hill. I was waiting for my husband to come back with help. The other three were sleeping. I didn't mention this to anyone till later in the day. The 17-year-old said that she had heard walking around the truck and that she knew the difference between two and four feet stepping around and that it was something on two feet. She didn't see anything, though. In June of 1970, I was riding my motorcycle to Janolan Caves. Around 10 a.m., the sky darkened, and I decided to continue to the Canangra Walls. As I drove along the gum-lined road near Auberon, a silvery glow suddenly overcame me, lighting up the road ahead. Unable to stop, I drove straight into the glow. The recently darkened sky allowed the bright glow to illuminate the surrounding forest, seemingly originating from above. As I entered the glow, I was lifted quickly towards a large circular object. Once inside, the floor closed beneath me, leaving me standing in a glowing light blue room. The room was hexagonal and flat, about fifty feet across and twelve feet high. I was terrified, but a voice in my head reassured me and... I began to relax. A wall section slid open, and three alien-looking beings about six feet tall with grayish-blue skin approached me. They had teeth, noses, and sex organs similar to humans, but their eyes were like a doze. The beings led me into another room with strange equipment and a large metallic oblong block which had a body-shaped groove in it. After examining me, they asked me to lie in the groove where I felt magnetized and glued to the metal. Eventually, I passed out. When I regained consciousness, I was surrounded by multiple blue beings. Two of them held my clothes, shoes, and belongings. I dressed myself as they watched, and they led me through a brightly lit passageway to a large tube-shaped walkway, which led to a colossal building. Inside, I saw countless male and female beings communicating telepathically. I was led to a green dome-shaped building where I would temporarily reside. It had odd furniture, a rubbery bed, and a toilet made of crystal-like metal. The two beings showed me various fruits and vegetables to eat and drinks in plastic jars and bottles. During my stay, I was flown in an oval-shaped hovercraft vehicle along a metallic road to a vast museum. 
like building, and later to a different world with narrow waterways and forests of tall trees. I saw a large ocean with drinkable water and various watercraft. My captors informed me that I'd been taken for study and that they had studied my memory and brain. Before I lost consciousness, I was told that the inhabitants of this planet were called Ultra, beings at the peak of evolution. And when I woke up, I would possess higher knowledge. When I came to, I was lying on the road beside my motorcycle, half an hour before my abduction. Confused, I got up, started my motorcycle, and went home. My family didn't believe my story, and eventually, after suffering a breakdown due to my experience, I left the country with them. My friends and I were inseparable. Our favorite pastime was playing manhunt in the dense forest near our neighborhood. The thrill of chasing each other through the woods and the adrenaline rush of trying not to be caught kept us entertained for hours on end. One summer evening we had split up into teams and the game was in full swing. The forest had always felt eerie and the sense of being watched was ever-present, but we were young and fearless and the excitement of the game outweighed any lingering uneasiness. As darkness fell, we started to lose track of each other. My friend, let's call him Mike, had wandered deeper into the forest, drawn by what he believed were our voices calling out to him. The calls grew louder and more insistent, luring him further into the dense woods. Mike eventually stumbled upon an unsettling scene. Small figures made of sticks were hanging from the trees all around him, like eerie effigies, swaying gently in the breeze. In the middle of the forest, he found a church that seemed to appear out of nowhere, its presence entirely out of place. The calls he had been following abruptly stopped, leaving him with a chilling silence. What Mike didn't know was that we had left the forest long before, concerned for his safety and unable to locate him. The voices he had heard were not ours, and he couldn't shake the feeling that something sinister had been trying to lure him deeper into the woods. Terrified, Mike raced back towards the edge of the forest, desperate to escape the haunting scene he had just witnessed. When he finally emerged, breathless and shaken, we were waiting for him. As he recounted his experience, we couldn't help but feel a shiver run down our spines. To this day... We don't know how much of Mike's story was true, or whether his imagination had gotten the better of him. But one thing was certain, the forest had always been a place where we felt uneasy. We had come across broken bottles, mysterious teepees, and signs of demonic activity, likely the work of mischievous teenagers with a can of spray paint. But after that night, we couldn't shake the feeling that something darker lurked within those woods. We never played manhunt in the forest again, and the memories of our carefree teenage years were forever tinged with the eerie echoes of that one fateful night. When I was around ten, I was walking along a track near the ocean with my parents. I ran ahead and heard a commotion in the tree above me. I looked up in time to see a possum's carcass drop at my feet. Its head was gone. I had spooked an eagle. I immediately looked back at my dad, thinking it was some practical joke he's pulled. When we were walking back, we saw a couple and warned them to watch out for flying headless possums. They must have thought we were crazy. My day started like any other summer day, only this time I had the whole day to myself. It was August 7th, and I had decided to spend it in the beautiful town of Valsets, Oregon, specifically on the south fork of the Silitz River. I was just a mile west of the town, an area now closed due to fire danger. My plan was to enjoy a peaceful day panning for gold, something I've found to be incredibly calming and rewarding over the years. The morning was beautiful, with a cool breeze and the sun's rays piercing through the tall trees. After a while, I got lost in the peaceful rhythm of panning. Suddenly, a smell hit me. It was peculiar and strong, something I hadn't experienced before. 
It was a mixture of wet dog and something else I couldn't put my finger on. Lifting my gaze from the shimmering water, I, I saw it. Through the rim of my glasses, I could see a figure standing tall and motionless. I squinted, adjusting my glasses for a clearer view, and there it was, a creature that could only be described as a Bigfoot, staring right at me. It was about eight feet tall, covered in dark fur, its eyes holding an intelligent yet wild gaze. My heart pounded in my chest as a wave of fear washed over me. However, instead of screaming or running, I decided to talk softly to the creature trying to show it. I meant no harm. To my surprise, it tilted its head slightly, as if listening, then turned around and walked away into the forest. Still shaken, I packed my gear and headed for my car, my day of peaceful panning now transformed into a day I'd never forget. As I drove off, I glanced at the trees, and there it was, another one silently standing and watching from the forest's edge. Now I know there will be skeptics reading this, it's not every day someone claims to have seen a Bigfoot, let alone two in one day, but I stand by what I saw, and as incredible as it may sound, it wasn't the first time. Over the years I've been fortunate, or maybe just plain lucky, to have had about forty or fifty encounters with these elusive creatures. My experiences have made me believe that there's a lot more to this world than we think we know. I was backpacking with my boyfriend in the mountains in Colorado. The area was fairly popular, a big parking lot, with a few trails that split off into different directions. We had passed through a big valley and were making our way up through steep woods with lots of switchbacks. We were carrying good-sized packs and planned to camp in an alpine meadow above. It was summer, good weather, good times. I have a few guns, and I brought one that I hadn't hiked with before. A Smith & Wesson 4-inch 686. It was heavy. We took turns carrying it in the holster and in hand, not on my hip like I do with my smaller and lighter 3-inch Smith. I'd started with it on my hip, but it was too big, awkward, heavy. My boyfriend is carrying the gun as we turn past another switchback. We see a guy coming down the trail towards us. A few unusual things immediately caught our attention. One, he didn't have a backpack or water or any gear at all. We were a few miles in, so someone should at least have water. Two, he was wearing surgical-type gloves, for real, not regular outdoor gloves. Not some newfangled hipster outdoor gloves from REA. Actual surgical gloves in the middle of the forest. Three, he had an extremely creepy expression, eyes too big and wide, icky too big smile. My boyfriend and I exchanged a few quick words before he reached us, getting mentally prepared. My boyfriend had the gun if we needed it, and we stepped off the trail slightly so he wouldn't pass too close. He just smiled his creepy smile and went past. Because my boyfriend was carrying that heavy gun in his hand, still holstered, that dude knew we had a gun. It obviously wasn't pointed at the guy, but he knew. As we went on, my boyfriend and I kept stopping and checking to be sure he wasn't coming back behind us. Not far past this, we saw a bit of blue tarp poking out from behind a large rock. We both thought it could be a body or something, so my boyfriend checked and wasn't happy to have that job. Just a tarp, crumpled but in good shape, seemed to have been put there recently. Not sure why it would be way up there, though. We eventually reached the Alpine Lake and camped. Nothing bad happened. There was another couple somewhat nearby on one side of the lake, which made me feel better. Normally, I'd rather be alone after backpacking in. But they were closer to the trail. So if the crazy dude came back, maybe he'd go after them first and we would hear something. I know that's really horrible to think say that, but they were a buffer. Anyway, nothing bad happened. But we never forgot that, dude. I am so glad I wasn't alone. Thank you, boyfriend. Why no gear or water, but surgical gloves and a lunatic expression a few miles in on a mountain trail.
I had a pretty close encounter in September 1994, I believe, near Tallgate, Oregon, during elk bow season. I had been in the woods for several days. I was tracking a head elk on the north side of USFS Road 64, Skyline, about opposite Jubilee Lake at about 1 or 2 p.m. I was down the Skookum Spring side of Dusty Ridge, about one quarter to half mile from Dusty Spring, an abandoned campground and saw movement about seventy yards cross lope and down at the edge of a clearing, some thirty or forty yards across a large biped with unusually long seeming arms walked across the clearing heading away and up slope at an unhurried pace. Near the far edge of the clearing, it stopped and turned, looking directly at me. It was covered head to foot in hair, dark brownish in color, and I got a very too good, actually, look at it. It knew I was there, I have no doubt to this day. It then turned and continued away. I saw it for perhaps two minutes in bright sunlight. I vacated the area without finding my elk or going over to look for tracks. I can say it was not a man or anything I have seen before. As it walked, it swung its arms, but they were so that the palms of the hand was clearly to the rear, and much nearer the knees as opposed to the hip as mine are. The date time can be better established because when I got home and was telling my wife, she said that the previous weekend some guy had taken videos of Bigfoot at Hoodoo Springs, some twenty miles from where I was at, and they had been on the news. I have no pictures, but can certainly take someone to the spot without difficulty, even now. I was eighteen and was going to a friend, say, Mike, house with another friend of mine, let's call him Joe, on my bike, motorcycle, to be clear. So we reached this friend's house, which was in first floor. We tried calling him out from the street. His moms came out and said he wasn't home. We started again from there to another spot, where we and a couple of other friends hang out. Just after we start, Joe tells me to go the same spot that I had in mind, and I tell him I had the same thoughts, too. Now we reach the spot, and almost all of our friends are there, as expected. I had a tiny little chat, which barely lasted a minute, and then noticed that Joe wasn't behind me. I concluded myself that he was playing me and asked the guys where he was hiding. They had no idea what I was talking about. I thought of pranking them all back and decided to leave the place so that Joe would have to walk back home. A couple of hundred meters later, Joe walks towards me from a completely different direction. I was completely blank, cuz. I'm the only one with a motorcycle, and nobody else could drop him there from the spot. I asked him how he got there. Joe, I got down at the Mike's home. When you started, I was screaming for you to stop, but you just kept going. I was like, who was I talking to then, on the way to the spot? The solitude that comes with living in a national park can be both intoxicating and haunting. I spent three months as the sole human inhabitant in one, a seemingly endless expanse of nature that was both my home and my sanctuary. The experience was mostly peaceful, the silence broken only by the sounds of the wind, the trees, and the occasional wildlife. But there was something else that often punctuated the quiet music. It was a melody as soft and tinkling as a music box, or perhaps a distant ice cream truck on a hot summer day. The peculiar thing was, it always seemed to echo from somewhere above me, a melody floating on the breeze, an auditory illusion that was both fascinating and slightly unsettling. One day, driven by curiosity, I decided to track the source of the enigmatic music. I followed the dirt road that wound past my humble trailer, guided only by the elusive ethereal melody that continued to waft through the trees. But as I ventured further, it was difficult to gauge if I was getting closer or if the source was just as elusive as before. My eyes were fixed on the treetops, straining to locate the origin of the strange sounds when my gaze was drawn downward. A snake lay stretched out in the path ahead. I stumbled backward in surprise, but the creature made no move. 
It took me a moment to understand why. The snake was dead. My heart pounded in my chest as I looked around and saw that the snake wasn't alone. Half a dozen dead copperheads lay strewn across the road, their lifeless bodies all aligned in the same direction. It was as if they had been journeying somewhere, only to be simultaneously struck down. Fear snaked its way up my spine, replacing my curiosity with a primal instinct to retreat. I couldn't bring myself to step over the ominous assembly of deceived serpents. Turning around, I rushed back to my trailer, intent on using my car to navigate past the eerie spectacle. But as I fumbled for my keys, the music abruptly ceased. The ensuing silence was almost deafening, filling the space the melody had previously occupied. The sudden stop seemed to echo the strange, unsettling event I had just witnessed. Despite my numerous walks afterward, the music never returned. The only reminders of that day were the silent woods and the memory of the bizarre serpentine gathering on the road. The experience became another secret shared between the park and me, an enigma that underscored the underlying mystery and magic of nature. This started as early as my childhood. I reckon I'm what my religion or community describes as special. I have the ability to see the paranormal. However, I'm taught to be as logical and scientific as possible since young. I often try to explain my special encounters as reflection of light. My eyes are blurry, bad lightnings. So let me tell you a bit more about my vision since young. Often then, not I see black mist figures, and I can't exactly see their facial expression. Just a vague human-like body covered with either black or white cloth, and they merely appear for a blink of an eye. However, this one incident had me convinced that truly whatever I have seen or encountered was not just my imagination. In my Asian community, we tend to stay at our parents till we are married or whenever we are financially stable of affording one. Houses in the Asian community are not cheap at all. So being a college undergraduate after working on my thesis till 3 a.m., I decided to call it a night, switch on my night lights and get ready for my night reading. Halfway through, a white figure with a distorted face and lenny hair came floating into my room. I definitely had my window closed since I lived in an air-conditioned room. It was staring at me as it made its way to the side of my bed slowly, gently and silently. Fear intertwined my every cells, my body unable to obey my command. Her bloodshot eyes locked with mine, and abruptly she let out an eerie shriek for a minute or two and disappear into thin air. My parents, upon hearing the shriek, came rushing in as I burst into tears. Till this date, we have no explanation whom it was or what's its purpose. When I was a police officer, I had the ability to bond with folks with mental health issues. They would calm down and the situation would defuse itself. There was one older woman. She had an apartment but would wander the streets at all hours. She would scream at passing cars, go into businesses, and, and start asking for money and steal people's food, etc. She also shoplifted a lot. Needless to say, she got arrested a lot. When she would be arrested, she would fight like a wildcat, injuring herself and the officers arresting her, except for me. I would say, Annie, you're going to have to go with me now, and she would. The first time I arrested her, I asked if she had eaten, and she said no. So I stopped at KFC and got her a two-piece and a biscuit. Drove real slow to the jail so she could eat. After that, when she got caught stealing, she would request me to take her in. I didn't mind because no one got hurt. Annie didn't bathe real regular so that to freshen up, she would splash herself with Stetson aftershave. The combination of her body odor and the Stetson could really gag you. Fast forward, and I've gotten promoted to sergeant. Right after coming on for afternoon shift, we get a fatal car accident. Annie had walked into the street at rush hour and been run over by a truck. 
pretty bad scene. The wheel crushed her head, and I couldn't help but be depressed, because while she could be a pain, she couldn't help it. It was just sad. When I got promoted, I was issued an unmarked car to replace my marked unit 361. I was out on the road later that evening when dispatch got a call that someone was breaking into one of the cruisers parked behind the station. They said the person was in the back seat, sitting. I was close and responded. The citizen pointed out the cruise, and it was my old one, 361. When I got to it, no one was in it. I opened it up and was immediately hit with the overpowering smell of Stetson aftershave. When I was just a kid, roughly 14, I am now 20, my dad and I went archery hunting on state game land a couple miles from our house. There were a lot of tram roads from people mining for coal back in the days. That said, we were a mile from the main road where we had our tree stands. It, my dad's stand was about 100 yards east of mine. Anyway, it was getting dark, so I knew to head out of the stand and meet my dad at the truck. I heard all this crashing and thought one. My dad was meeting my at my stand for once and two. He was making a lot of noise. So I turned my head and boom, I see two little bear cubs play fighting with one another. They couldn't have been a year old. Truly a beautiful sight to see. However, what terrified me the most, where was Mama Bear? I immediately called my dad freaking out. He said, well, you're an idiot for staying in the woods this long. Should have been at the truck by now. Just make your way towards me. I'll meet you on the trail. The cubs were far enough out to where I could still see them, but there was a good distance between us. With my arrow still notched and my three-pocket knife in my hand, I climbed out of my stand and tried to be as quiet as possible. I met my dad, and we made it home. I have never been more terrified of the woods. Except when I run into a spider web hanging face, level in the middle of a trail, heart attack every time. I work in the field of prison corrections where surveillance is a critical part of our operations. In the supervisor's control booth, I have a clear view of the inmate housing unit control booths where my deputies closely monitor the activities of the inmates. One particular night, as I glanced at the CCTV monitors, I noticed my deputy sitting in the control booth. Curiosity struck me, and I decided to call him to inquire about the person standing behind him. It was an odd sight, because there shouldn't have been anyone else present as everyone had responded to an emergency call. To my surprise, he replied that he was alone in the booth. Confused, I continued watching as the figure remained there, while my deputy diligently searched for the mysterious presence. As soon as he settled back in his seat and picked up the telephone, the figure vanished into thin air. Determined to make sense of what I had witnessed, I hurriedly went to review the security footage, hoping to capture evidence of the strange figure. However, as I meticulously examined the recorded footage, there was no trace of the mysterious entity. It was as if it had never appeared on the screen at all. Ever since that incident, whenever my gaze falls upon that particular camera angle on the monitor, a shiver runs down my spine. The memory of that inexplicable sight lingers haunting me to this day, even though it happened six years ago. The U.S. Valkyrie, a formidable military submarine, prowled through the dark depths of the ocean, its sleek hull slicing through the water with precision. Inside, the hum of machinery and the distant echoes of conversations filled the air as the crew carried out their duties with practiced efficiency. The familiar scent of metal and seawater lingered, a constant reminder of the unforgiving environment surrounding them. As John stood at his station, monitoring the gauges and screens, his focus was abruptly shattered by a sudden commotion. One of the soldiers positioned near the porthole let out a startled cry, pointing urgently towards the inky blackness outside. He followed his gaze, his heart pounding in his chest. Something was moving in the abyss, something massive and unnatural. 
A sense of foreboding settled over him as he strained to make out the shape that emerged from the depths. The flickering lights of the submarine revealed elongated limbs and glimmering scales that sent a shiver down his spine. Attempting to warn his teammates, he yelled, his voice drowned out by the alarm bells and the increasing cacophony of panicked voices. And then it happened. Glass shattered, metal groaned, and the unknown creatures breached the submarine. Chaos erupted as the terrifying beings swarmed in, their alien forms twisting and contorting through the narrow corridors. John was no more. In the midst of the ensuing struggle, John found himself separated from his fellow soldiers, forced to fend off the relentless onslaught alone. The creatures moved with a primal hunger, their movements a macabre dance of agility and savagery. He fought back with all his strength, desperately seeking a way to repel these monstrous assailants. But alas, John was no more. I'm Andrew, a Navy SEAL. I was at the gym when I received an assignment, a call from high command to lead a team of Navy SEALs on a mission to uncover the fate of the U.S. Valkyrie. We descended into the abyss, our specialized gear protecting us from the crushing pressures as we ventured deeper into the uncharted underwater cavern where the last signal was. As we penetrated the narrow passageways, we encountered the lifeless, hulking remains of the submarine, its trapped crew frozen in a horrifying tableau of death, all thirty marines dead. The sight sent a chill down my spine, but there was no time for fear. We pressed forward, driven by the need to understand what had transpired. And then, amid the dimly lit cavern, we came face to face with the true horror that had claimed the Valkyrie. A monstrous amalgamation of octopus and shark, its razor-sharp tentacles and gleaming jaws poised for the kill. It was a creature born of nightmares, an apex predator that had, that had adapted to the extreme depths. Trapped in the suffocating darkness, our senses heightened and we fought with every ounce of strength we possessed. The creature's intelligence and ferocity surpassed our expectations, as if it had been waiting for our intrusion. With limited resources and the weight of impending doom pressing upon us, we battled on, a relentless struggle for survival. In the depths of that abyss, surrounded by the bodies of fallen comrades and the relentless onslaught of the monstrous creature, I realized that we were facing an enemy beyond our comprehension. The fight for our lives became a desperate test of willpower and skill as we grappled with the haunting question. Could we emerge from the depths or would we become mere echoes in the dark, forever lost to the unknown terrors that lurked beneath the surface? As the relentless battle waged on, we were pushed to our physical and mental limits. The creature's tentacles lashed out with a deadly precision, while its massive jaws snapped menacingly seeking to devour any vulnerable prey in its path. The cavern echoed with the sounds of gunfire and the desperate cries of my teammates. We strategized and coordinated our attacks, exploiting every weakness we could find. But the creatures seemed to anticipate our every move, evading our bullets and counterattacking with a terrifying ferocity. Its intelligence was undeniable, and it was clear that we were dealing with a force of nature unlike anything we had encountered before. As the hours turned into an endless struggle for survival, the cavern became a twisted labyrinth, each turn leading us deeper into the heart of darkness. Our equipment dwindled, our bodies weakened, but our determination remained unyielding. Failure was not an option. With every passing moment, the line between reality and nightmare blurred. The oppressive darkness seemed to seep into our souls, playing tricks on our minds. Whispers echoed through the depths, insidious voices taunting us with our impending doom. One by one, my comrades fell, consumed by the insatiable hunger of the creature. Their sacrifices fueled my determination, igniting a fire within me that refused to be extinguished. I fought with a renewed vigor, unleashing a final surge of energy against the relentless adversary. In a desperate maneuver, I managed to dodge the creature's deadly grasp and strike a decisive blow. The cavern trembled as the beast let out an otherworldly shriek, 
its monstrous form convulsing in its death throes. Silence fell upon the battlefield, broken only by the heavy panting of my exhausted breath. With the creature defeated, I surveyed the wreckage of our mission. The bodies of my fallen comrades lay scattered, their sacrifice a haunting reminder of the horrors that lurked in the depths. I felt a mixture of sorrow, pride, and survivor's guilt coursing through my veins. As I made my way back to the surface, the weight of the encounter settled upon my shoulders. The ocean's depths held secrets beyond human comprehension and the unknown creatures that dwelled there were a testament to the unfathomable mysteries of the world. I lived out in the boonies, so there were only a handful of houses near me, and I never really saw anyone. Every day when I was twelve-ish, I would walk out in random directions through the forest just for something to do. One day I walked off the main road onto a dirt road for a few miles, and at the very end I found an abandoned house. Not unusual for the area, so I just looked around for a bit, but nothing too interesting. Behind the house I noticed an old trail that went into another forest, so I followed it. I went down about two miles, and it took me to an abandoned summer camp. Now... This was interesting. When I looked around the place, though, there were little signs that people were still there. Small animal traps set out, piles of clothing and garbage, food, etc. This freaked me out a lot, but I was pretty brave or stupid, so I kept looking around. That was until three men emerged from one of the buildings. They were dirty and unshaven and pretty old and large. The moment I saw them, I started sprinting away leaving my bag and everything. I got out to a clearing and stopped to catch my breath and looked around to see if I was safe, and I wasn't. They came into the clearing, attempting to run after me. I was being followed. I continued sprinting until I got back to the abandoned house. I couldn't run anymore, so I went into the basement and hid inside a cupboard, crying at that point. I heard them talking outside the house and walking around. Luckily, the building was so old, the floors could barely hold me at 90 pounds, let alone those gigantic men, so they couldn't go in. Eventually, it went silent. I still stayed in there for a long time, though, just in case they were still outside. By the time I came out, the sun was setting, and they were gone. When I got home, my parents freaked out since I was gone for so long, and I just burst into tears and told them the whole story. My dad couldn't believe I went so far away and told me that a band of hicks that are notorious for committing petty crimes lived less than a mile from the camp. After learning everything, I was pretty deterred from going out for a while. I can't imagine what might have happened if I, they caught me. My husband, boyfriend at the time, and I were camping at Harriet Lake, which is a small lake pretty deep in the Willamette National Forest. We were on a road trip from San Francisco to Vancouver, British Columbia at the time, and decided to spend one of the days exploring Portland for the first time, since our campsite was only about 90 minutes outside of town. On the way back to the campsite, we approached the last stoplight in the last town, Estacada, Oregon before the highway narrowed to one lane in each direction. At the red light, we were pulled up next to a couple on a, a motorcycle. They looked to be in their fifties. The man in front was short and pudgy, while the woman was tall and lanky. I joked to my husband that they looked like Boris and Natasha from the Rocky and Bullwinkle show. When the light turned green, they looked over at us, took off, cut in front of us, and disappeared pretty quickly down the curvy road ahead. I remember us thinking we had somehow pissed them off because they were driving really aggressively. Soon after, we found ourselves deep in the forest. The winding road was flanked by cliffs on the left and the sparkling, rushing Clackamas River on the right. Several small, old green metal bridges passed over the winding river. Cell signals quickly disappeared, the sun was setting, and there were very few other people around except for a few fishermen trying to get one last catch before the sun went down for the night. 
As we approached the last bridge before the turnoff that led to the campground, we noticed that Boris and Natasha were parked sideways in the middle of the bridge, as as we got closer to them we realized that they were staring at us, as if they were waiting for us. I noticed that Natasha was holding something in her hand. Whatever it was, it was producing a fair amount of smoke. I thought maybe we had come across them smoking a cigar or a blunt or something. As we slowed down and prepared to pass them on the bridge, I got a closer look at whatever was in her hand and realized that there was way too much smoke coming from it. Right as we were passing them, she tossed the smoking object under our car and they scooted off the bridge, then turned around and looked at us as if they were waiting for something. My husband had the quick thinking to swerve and accelerate out of there, and not a moment too soon, as the object exploded forcefully right after our car cleared it. Boris and Natasha, having failed to accomplish whatever their goal was, disable our car and then rob us, kidnap us, kill us, sped off down a side road. While my husband was furious, I was totally freaked out. I was convinced that they were following us, or had been following us earlier in the day. I was 100% certain that they would return to our campsite in the night, where we were defenseless in our tent, and finish the job, get rid of the witnesses. Fortunately, we never saw them again. I've already written one story, but I'll add in another because it's more funny than creepy, but in the moment it scared the shit out of me. So meandering my way through the woods to this one area that had been affected by a brush fire a few years back. Tons of dead fallen trees and branches which makes for excellent kindling, which is what my dad sent me out there for. It was around 5 or 6 p.m., but was bright out since it was mid-June. I'm walking looking down at my phone texting and I stopped for a moment to quick hit send and even though I'd stopped walking, I could still hear leaves crunching. Oh, I freeze and look up as slowly as possible and less than 15 feet in front of me was a black bear. He looks at me. I look at him. It's June, it's mating season and he was one big mother F. I keep looking at him. He keeps looking at me. I'm frozen stiff and this guy is too. I think he could feel how little of a threat I actually was, because after a moment he snorted and just walked off. I broke land speed record sprinting back to my house, and at first my dad thought. I was messing with him, but I, I was like dad, no. Real bear. Big bear. As I'm like gasping for breath, and finally he walked into the woods to see for himself and stepped right in a fresh pile of bear poop. I told him stepping in poop was payback for him being skeptical. Falling asleep in my hammock while on a backpacking trip only to wake up in the middle of the night surrounded by dark moving objects, flicked my headlamp on to reveal a small herd of elk now standing stock still staring at a very confused frightened human with a light on its head. They all held that position for several seconds then bolted. Elk are a lot bigger and menacing when you're by your lonesome and they are within arm's length of you. Some years ago, my brother and I, he was like 11 and I two years older, made some small hiking tours in the forest surrounding our village. One time we found that little abandoned shed there with just one room without a door and a small porch. There was nothing really interesting, just some newspapers from 10 to 15 years ago lying on the ground. But we were little kids and found this mysterious, so we came back a few times. It happened the last time we were there. Suddenly, when we were about to go, I heard a loud noise from the attic, which was locked with a shutter on the outside of the shed. I thought it sounded like something wanting to move out there. We left that place in a hurry. A few weeks later, we decided to go there again, and suddenly a woman I've never seen before went into our way. She asked us where we wanted to go, and we answered with nowhere. Then she said something like, then bugger off, and we ran away. There was nothing else there except this cabin, and we were not on private property. I've never been there again. 
but I'm 17 now, so I think I should pay it another visit. Not a very mysterious tale, but I would be interested to know who that woman and what that noise was. My dad and myself went to the rural country cemetery located in the bowels of the mountains. This cemetery has been there for at least 80 to 90-ish years. The cemetery sits on a small hill with a very steep road going up, and only a very good truck with four-wheel drive or an off-roading vehicle. It is located in between a four-way with only one home, a double-wide trailer located down the hill. It has been empty and for sale for about a year or two and was empty during the time of our visit. It has a fence encircling it and two pine trees sitting in the middle of it. That is where my family is buried at. My grandmother and grandfather are both buried there as well as also my uncle has his ashes buried there at the foot of my grandfather's vault. Three other aunts and uncle are also buried there as well as also my great-grandparent. We got out and went in through the chain lock gate that you have to pull apart and open from the outside, and we sat there at the grave of my grandparents for about 20 or 30 minutes talking. We sometimes like to walk around the grounds for a little bit before we headed back to town, and today was no different. We walked around looking at the graves from the 17 and 1800s, as well as Cherokee graves marked by rocks at the very back of the cemetery. However, I find something odd on the ground by the flat grave marker of a grave from the 1800s. It was a large bare foot, at least two times larger than my own. I sat there stunned by what I was seeing. Its big toe was extremely large and round, in the shape of a quarter, perfectly round. Its arch was very broad and curved, very sharply making the rest of the foot almost look sideways in appearance. Whatever it was, was there the night prior passing through. I inspected the ground surrounding the rest of the cemetery and saw nothing else. No other tracks. Nothing. When I got home, I told my mother what had happened. She seemed to believe me and my father, considering I never had lied about or seen anything like that before, and could see the amazement on my face. Sometime later, my aunt happened to be visiting, and I told her about the track I had found out there and what she told me was very creepy. She told me that when my other uncle, my father's other brother, was out there visiting the graves years prior, he had come home and said that something was in the cemetery. He said he had felt watched and was very creeped out being alone back there. Story 2. When my grandmother died in the fall or early winter of 2018, my aunt and uncle had moved into her trailer until they could secure a new home and move back from Tennessee to be closer to family. Many people who stayed the night there while my grandmother was still alive would swear that my grandfather's spirit, who died of cancer under hospice care in the trailer years prior, was haunting the residence. Strange footsteps in the night voices and knocking on the trailer walls would always be reported. My father had even encountered said oddities. The knocking would come from outside, and when looking outside or stepping out there with a gun, nothing was there. Prior to my grandmother's passing, my father's only living brother had come to visit her at the trailer one evening and said that he had seen my grandfather standing by her with his arm around her and said, Son, I'm going to see your mother very, very soon, and then he sh And my grandmother did join him a few months later. That was when my aunt and uncle had moved in. Afterwards, nothing strange happened. Yet, and eventually, they had found a suitable new home to move into and on a cold winter's night. In the dead of night, in the power to the trailer being cut, as you would expect, given the moving, the power bill didn't need to be paid. We arrived at the home and began moving them out. Boxes of clothes, TV, couch, and beds, all loaded into the U-Haul parked in the front yard with the engine running and keys in the ignition. Suddenly, every light source we had helping us see suddenly went out. The flashlight we had hung on the front porch facing the front door went out, and the U-Haul's engine completely died. We went back out and turned them back on. However, a few minutes later... You did it again. Everything went black. 
That is when I started being followed around while inside the rooms of the trailer. I felt like someone was following me around, and I swear at times I would hear a female voice saying, Hi, as well as also a male spirit, which was also heard by my father while in the living room. This continued on, and finally after everything was loaded into the U-Haul and we regrouped outside, getting ready to leave, we were talking out in the front yard. I swear I could hear someone walking across the hardwood floors in the home. We left a few minutes later. A new family moved in a few months later after doing some rehab on the trailer, and as far as we know, no other paranormal activity has been reported since. Story 3 my father and my, myself was driving back to town after visiting my aunt, his sister, and my uncle. It was late evening and raining. Everything was muddy and wet, and fog was hovering somewhat over the hills and ridge lines. Well, we got to the bend in the round, a little curve about a mile out from their house, when suddenly this woman with short black hair comes walking out of the dense, thick woods. Beside the wood, my father almost hit her head on and swerved to avoid her. She was wearing a rain jacket and black sweatpants and dirty tennis shoes. It looked like she had been in the woods all night and maybe even all week long. She had mud all over her pants. Her jacket and shirt underneath was soaking wet and her hair was a mess. She looked very disheveled and stared at us all the way up the road, just starring. I even looked back in the Riverview mirror, and she was still up there at the side of the road, looking at us, not even moving back into the woods or walking away, just starring. She was never seen again. I often wondered just what the hell she was doing out there, wet and alone. Perhaps she was kidnapped. Whatever the case, however, something was off about her. My brother and his friend were deer hunting in some woods up in the area close to his home. This was multiple years ago, so nothing recent. They were going through the woods with their guns when suddenly they spot something up in a tree watching them. This thing jumps from the high vantage point. It's at around 10 or 20 feet high and falls all the way down to the ground below without being seriously injured. It was covered in thick mattered hair and it was on two legs. They aimed their guns at it, but the thing screamed at them, though he considered it more like a roar, and charged them. They ran out of the woods as fast as they could, as this thing chased them for quite some time before finally losing it and getting back home in one piece. My aunt and uncle are the oldest of my mother's family. My uncle had served in the Vietnam War and was even at one point during his stay overseas captured along with his brother. They were held hostage by the Viet Cong in the jungles. He would often tell stories of how they would whip them and beat them mercilessly and throw fesses on them all. After he returned home, they lived up in the rural area where my mother's family had grew up in their whole lives before she had moved to the city and started a private and home nursing hospice center where my aunt had personally cared for deathly ill patients. From dementia to cancer, she treated them all with respect and kindness. However, around the early 2010s, after she had long since retired and my uncle starting to become ill, as well the organization whom helped get them the house in the first place had foreclosed on them, they were forced to move into a retirement home by the interstate. It was a high-rise apartment building located by the interstate. Mostly only elderly and handicapped were living there, well around a few months to maybe a year to their stay there. One night they saw an elderly woman who had Alzheimer's walking across a frozen pond near the building. No one even knew she was even gone. They watched in horror as the woman fell through the ice and drowned in the lake. No one discovered her body until the next morning. After that, however, some say her spirit lingered in the building. My aunt and uncle would often talk about how they would hear footsteps. And one night, my uncle had gotten up for something to drink in the middle of the night to see the woman standing there in the middle of the living room. Frightened, he flicked on the light and she vanished. This continued for months and weeks as the spirit of the woman haunted their living area. 
Eventually, though, they were forced to move again after my uncle had dementia for years prior. But it started to progress even more during this time, and just last year, he would loose his long battle with the evil disease. The house I moved into was close to a Native American burial site. The landlord out of nowhere said the last tenants experienced ghosts. I wondered why she brought that up, blew it off, whatever. The garage had a single light bulb with a pull string on it. I'm sitting eye level to it about two feet away, smoking a cigarette. I watch it pull straight down and click off. I run inside, try to chill. My mom gets home and I tell her what happened. She thought I was just making it up, didn't really believe it. Two months go by, I'm sitting on the couch. She runs in the house, pale as can be. The light string pulled down again, right in front of her. Other things happened in that house, but nothing ever threatening. That changed my mind on the world around me. Whether it was a parallel dimension that was somehow interacting or a ghost, that house changed my life. In school, my friend's taking photography class had images of this cool and creepy local abandoned hospital in the town across the river. It had the lovely nickname Killer Cobb, so like any sensible people in their 20s would do, I snuck in with my two classmates to check it out. It was one of my most surreal moments in my life. The first creepy thing was one room that looked like it had dried fruit scattered across the floor. In the next room, there were plastic tubs with names, dates, and numbers on them. Each tub had organs and body parts in them and preservatives. The room with the fruit was covered in dumped-out organs. All the way through the place, the power was on. It had been shut down for about a decade. Parts of the ceiling were falling in and windows were missing. It was totally Silent Hill quality. The creepiest was the holes in the wall that appeared to be blasted into it. The shatterproof glass with the wires in it had chunks blown out. Looked like someone had fired a shotgun through the place. There were areas that had splashes of what looked like dried blood near the holes, and we found a stretcher that had a pool dried of blood that ran off the sides and under it. We got to the third floor, and as I am peeping through a window on a set of double doors, scoping out the halls that were dark to check for anything that might, you know, want to kill us, I saw this stick start coming out from behind the corner. Then I understood that I saw the shadow of a man holding a shotgun coming down the hall and dropped low behind the door. I ran to the others and we noped out with a quickness. We reported the creepy possible murders and very real biohazards to the local news channel. Years later it was torn down. Another, I was working on a painting at my school, and my instructor had her kids in the building. They played and giggled, running around the whole time. I heard it, but it didn't bother me. I was really into my project, and time slipped by quickly. I realized at a point I was starving and looked down at my watch, realizing it was almost 2 a.m. I couldn't believe she and the kids were still there. As I walked to the door to tell them I was leaving, as I came to the door leading to the hallway, everything became completely quiet. I walked through the building to see what was up, and I was completely alone and creeped out. I peeked out the window that overlooked the parking lot. Nothing. I left and tried to not work up there by myself from that point forward. One of my friends had a similar experience. I am an outdoorsman. I'm very experienced in hunting, camping, hiking, and general survival. I'm very familiar and used to wildlife, and I was charged by what I believe was a cryptid called a dogma. It charged me and my cousin. It was not a bear. A bear cannot move how it did, and it was not a normal wolf as they can't comfortably run on two legs. Whereas what charged us seemed natural at doing. I can elaborate further if you wish. This happened around June or July of 2007, I believe. I was around 17 years old and more cocky then, but still somewhat knowledgeable of the outdoors. 
My family used to own a cabin in northwestern Wisconsin. I basically grew up there in the summer. I knew the woods well, but at night it was wise to stay in the cabin, or at least by the bonfire by the beach, because of bears, wolves, and cougars. One of the creepiest things was if you were having a bonfire. The tree line was visible from the fire pit and beach, and at night you always felt like you were being watched from that tree line. But during the day, the woods always seemed normal, not so creepy. That is until this incident. So this happened somewhere between 12, 14. Me and my cousin were having an airsoft battle. I was in full woodland camo. He was not. I retreated onto the ATV trail into the woods for a tactical advantage, and our battle took us about 200 meters in to about a third of the way up the trail. We had enough at this point and were standing at the edge of a clearing on the trail, talking, and he was maybe ten feet from me when I decided to mess with him. I shushed him and said we're being watched. He froze. Then I realized the woods were dead quiet, and I got spooked and started scanning the tree line and the other edge of the clearing from left to right when I saw it. Its teeth gave it away. It was panting and staring at my cousin. I don't expect you to believe me, but what I saw was a wolf as big as a black bear, at least 300 pounds, but it wasn't normal. This wolf was on two legs, crouching next to a tree with its arm grasping the tree grasping with a clawed hand it had reddish brown fur i told my cousin that we have to go and next thing i know he is sprinting and i look back at wolfie who had locked on and sprinted a few steps on two feet and then i turned and ran when it looked like wolfie was dropping to all fours it charged us and sounded right on our asses barreling through the brush but for whatever reason let us go when we broke out of the tree line and headed for the cabin what stuck with me the most was the sheer size. Wolfie appeared to be nearly seven feet tall when upright, and that where it should have had front paws, it appeared to have large clawed hands. Now I'm not sure how to explain it away rationally. I have heard wolves will occasionally kind of walk upright, but as far as I know, they can't sprint on two legs, nor do wolves get that big. And black bears more waddle on two legs. The closest description is silly, a werewolf or dogman. For years I lived in a little country town. My house was pretty far back in it, about 20-30 men from the nearest small city. To get back to my house from the city, you'd need to drive down a few paved roads. Them turn onto a dirt road that is just straight for about five miles, then turns into a typical winding country road. One night I turned onto the dirt road, and after a few miles I noticed a light on the side of the road that was still very far away. The section of the road I was on didn't have any houses. Only woods and the houses that were nearest were still about three miles down the road, plus located down their own little roads. It was completely pitch black, and something was weird about the light, like it was shaking. Like when someone is messing with you by reflecting the sun into your eyes off a shiny surface, they can't quite keep it still in your eyes, so it moves around quickly. The light stayed only pointing down the road in my direction, though. It was easy to spot as it was right on the side of the road on a pitch black night. As I got closer, my headlights began to light up the source of the light. It was a man, walking. I'm not a racist, but I can't say the same for the town I lived in. As a result, very few African Americans lived there. I mention this because the man holding the light was African American, so it was a bit odd to see any non-white person walking alongside the road, let alone this late at night. Something else was off, though. The man was wearing an aisle-fitting odd outfit of what looked like white burlap, as if he had taken a few burlap sacks, torn them up, and sewn them together. He was also holding a white paper bag with some sort of liquid covering the bottom, like it had spilled in the bag. Another thing was the fact that this road had virtually no walking space, and most of what was on the side of the road were ditches to move rainwater. Now, even all of this isn't what spooked me. 
He was walking in an eerily steady pace with a dead look on his face, going the same direction I was heading. It took me probably ten seconds of staring to realize that although he was heading away from me, his flashlight was pointing toward me. He was holding it backward in a fist, didn't even turn to look at me as I passed. I still don't have a clue how he could see to walk along the pitch black road why he was there or what was in his bag, but I sure as hell didn't stop to find out. Doing a road trip with a friend of mine driving from Tennessee to California, we planned out many stops along the way, trying to take in the sights of the country and avoid expensive hotels by camping. We had made it all the way down to Arizona and stopped in Flagstaff for dinner. Our next stop was to drive down to Sedona and camp at a free camping ground right off the interstate. When our exit came up, it was well into the dark hours. We pulled off, and the exit immediate turned into gravel road. Strange, but no problem my jeep could handle it. The road turned from gravel to just massive rocks, as tall trees seemed to surround us from now where. Our GPS cut out, and we began to wonder if we were lost. My friend then took the opportunity to begin telling alien abduction stories, which seemed harmless at first. We continued for a few more miles till we found a spot we figured we could camp out. As we pulled up, even before we got out, my friend said he thought he saw something moving along with us. I in disbelief, yet still freaked out enough by the alien stories, stopped the car. We waited and sure enough, I saw it too, one shadowy figure. No two, no three. Then more than I could count but just outside of light, so we couldn't make them out completely. Finally, when all the previous figures passed the last one, something looking 11 or 12 feet tall stood looking at us. We didn't sit for a moment longer. I put the car in gear and drove for another five miles. Needless to say, we were shook and making ridiculous assumptions on what we saw. We camped on that road, but stayed in the car. I didn't sleep well, I cannot say about my friend. Come morning time, our worries were put to rest. Around 5 a.m., a group of hunters came by us as we were getting up. Turns out the road was a prime spot for hunters to camp and hunt elk. They told us that they had spotted a herd, some 30, 40 strong, and let us borrow their binoculars to check them out, maybe a half mile off from our campsite. We continued down the road, which led directly into Sedona, and ran into our 12-feet friend from the night before, a massive moose. I'd never seen one before and had never known how huge they could get. He wandered across the path in front of us, took one look, and walked away. We sure were far more scared than need be, but having never been in that area in the state of mind, we, were in telling alien stories, sure worked us up. My family and I were making our way back home to Colorado from Texas. We made it home somewhere around 1 a.m., but Mom wanted to unpack the car that night so we wouldn't have to deal with it the following day. We lived out on an 80-acre piece of land about an hour east of Colorado Springs, and our nearest neighbors weren't for miles. It was pretty desolate. We didn't have electricity or running water. The goal was to be off the grid. The sky was clear, beautiful, stars everywhere. No sign of any bad weather. As we were unloading the car, though out of nowhere, we got hit with a fog so dense, you couldn't shine a light through it. You couldn't see your hands unless you touched them up to your face. It was already cold enough, and the sudden fog didn't help. The four of us froze in our tracks and called to one another. I managed to find the car and clung to it for dear life. My mother was closest to the house, and she managed to get to the door and unlock it. After that, we called to one another to see who was close to whom, what we were close to when the fog hit, and then Mom would call back. This went on for a solid 40 minutes. The fog did not go away. My father finally found me, and from there tracked down my sister. He tied ropes to our waist so we wouldn't lose one another. 
He echoed back and forth with my mother, which took another twenty minutes. The fog still wasn't gone. Finally, at long last, like a ghost popping through a wall, my mother appeared in front of us. We all got into the house immediately and warmed up in front of the propane heater. We looked out the windows, and it was as if someone had painted them over so you couldn't see out. Somewhere around 14 people died that night from the fog. It was one of the weirdest natural occurrences I'd ever experienced. I want to say I was 11 years old. Needless to say, from then on, we only arrived home during the day, if possible. If not, we'd stay in a hotel rather than risk dying in our front yard. I grew up in a small rural town nestled amidst the sprawling hills and dense forests of the Appalachian region. It was a place rich in history, with whispers of the past carried on the wind. The town had a quiet charm, its streets lined with quaint houses and storefronts, but beneath the surface there was an air of mystery and an unspoken warning that echoed through the generations. You see, our town was built upon land that once belonged to a Native American tribe, a land steeped in ancient traditions and legends. It was said that the spirits of the land still roamed freely, guarding their sacred grounds from unwelcome intruders. Over the years, tales emerged of white people who had ventured too far into the wilderness, never to return. It became a cautionary tale, a reminder that this land belonged to the natives, and it was dangerous for outsiders to roam free. One fateful summer, our town fell prey to a darkness that descended upon us like a shroud. A series of brutal killings began to plague our community, leaving us paralyzed with fear and disbelief. The victims' bodies were found mangled and torn apart their lives stolen by an unknown force of unimaginable strength. Whispers of bears and wild animals circulated, but deep down, we knew there was something more sinister at play. As the terror tightened its grip, an investigative journalist named Jake arrived in our town, drawn by the disturbing reports. His determination to uncover the truth led him to team up with Ayana, a resilient Native American tracker who possessed an intimate knowledge of the land and its secrets. Together they embarked on a treacherous journey to unravel the enigma that gripped our town. With each investigation they discovered a chilling connection among the victims. They had all encountered a creature, a werewolf-like being that prowled a specific place deep within the wilderness. Determined to confront this elusive creature and bring an end to the nightmare, Jake and Ayana ventured into the heart of the untamed wilderness. As they neared the creature's lair, a confrontation ensued, enveloping them in a violent clash between man and beast. In the chaos, Ayana, the fearless tracker, fell victim to the creature's ferocity. Her life extinguished before their mission reached its culmination. Yet Jake, fueled by grief and adrenaline, managed to land a critical blow on the creature, inflicting a wound that forced it to retreat into the shadows. Defeated but not eradicated, the creature known as the Shadow Howler vanished, leaving our town forever changed. Its haunting presence lingered in our collective memory, a reminder of the ancient power that still resided in the land. We mourned the loss of Ayana, a warrior who had given her life to protect her people, and we carried the weight of the encounter with the Shadow Howler as a solemn warning, a reminder that sometimes the darkness that dwells within the depths of the wilderness can rise up to claim even the bravest among us. I live in Pennsylvania and was doing an amateur paranormal investigation in a small wooded area. There is a large, recently built church in the area. I call the area the Broken Bridge due to having a few bridges around from horse and buggy days. The area is notorious for having high amounts of paranormal activity. Okay, main story. About five years ago, early summer, I was visiting the area with my girlfriend around sunset. We were laying in the grass next to the creek that separates the broken bridge area. Shortly we heard this giant snap as this tree limb from pretty high up fell to the ground maybe 50 feet away from us. 
This figure stood up from the spot it fell and started running extremely fast and far away. The figure, the best way to describe it, was a shadowy humanoid. It was about five or six feet tall and had long, skinny limbs. But where a head would normally be, there was none. Basically picture a Slenderman-type character, just formed of shadows and headless. That's what I saw years ago. From that day on, I have come to that area at night multiple times without seeing it again. About three nights ago, two friends and I were doing an amateur paranormal investigation in the same area. Aside from seeing normal shadow people with heads and normal limbs waltzing around the area, some unexplained voices and such, nothing has stuck out and spooked me like what happened. We were standing between a field opening and a few isolated trees. These trees aren't very, very large, small enough to be climbed, but not a lot of footing available as we've tried climbing them before. My buddy Matt chinned his flashlight at one of the trees while myself and another friend were looking away. A loud scratching slash clanking noise was heard for a second, and Matt quickly became terrified, screaming, Something just climbed that tree. Something humanoid climbed that trees. Side note, the tree was maybe 60 feet or so tall, and the thing was climbing from the very bottom. Spooked, we backed away and left the area. Later that night, Matt was obviously spooked, which isn't an easy thing, knowing him. Before I let his describe what he saw, I drew out the creature. I had seen years ago, and his face becomes pale as he tells me that is exactly what he saw climb the tree. I have no idea what the hell this thing is, nor do I know any similar animals in the area. In central Pennsylvania, we'll get the occasional bear, deer, hell, even some runaway cows. This humanoid wasn't a bear. Neither of us believe it was. Can anyone offer insight? I guess it was the summer of 2010, maybe 2011. A friend and I went to GameStop. It was during the times when video games were important in our lives, and we went there for a midnight release. So I guess we picked up the game somewhere around 12 o'clock. A little after. Game stops about 20 minutes from my house in Atala, Alabama. My family owns 180 acres. It's on a road called Ponderosa Road. So we leave from Game Stop and we're headed home. We got a night planned of just playing the game, so we're pumped up. So you go through a hollow across the bridge windy road, but you're heading upwards to get to our house. We're all on top of that mountain, as we call it. So there's a bit in the road. A single lane road. I'd say it's probably ten feet wide. Well, as we're coming up the hill, I don't have my brights on. I mean, I could drive that road in the dark. I've done it before when my headlights went out, but I didn't have my brights on. I'm just making my way to the house, and we go down a dip in the road, and as we go up the next hill, I notice something in the middle of the road. I just see something white, almost as wide as you would expect a human about as wide as a human is. The only way I know to explain it, so I hit my brakes and my light illuminates it. It was a human form, but it happened so quickly that I don't know any other way to explain it. It was way taller than a human should be. My uncle played professional baseball and he's almost seven feet tall. So is my dad. They're big wide guys and this thing would have made them, you know, look small. I couldn't even see shoulders. It was just like the bottom part of something white and human-like. But the crazy thing was when we saw it as soon as I hit the brakes. It all happened so quickly. I can't tell if it had wings and threw its wings out that were larger than ten feet. How wide the road is, larger than the road is. It literally stretched its body out. I know that sounds crazy, but almost like it was putty. That's what it was more like than wing. It just, like, got extremely wide and then skinny again and shot straight up into the air. I looked at my friend and asked him, Hey man, did you see that? I knew he saw it. I, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't crazy. And he said, Yeah, I saw it. We just didn't know what to do. I mean, it was close to my driveway, so we could just pull into the house. I was like, man, what was that? He said, You know, I don't have a clue. It was just really odd. 
We got into the house, made sure we locked the doors, and pulled the curtains on the windows. I still don't know to this day what it could have been. I think about it from time to time, especially out working late on the railroad. It was a clear night. I mean, no fog, warm summer night. I don't understand, and you know I've brought it up to the guy that was with me since then, and he still says I don't really know and I don't like to talk about it. I didn't really feel scared. It just happened so fast I didn't know what it was. I still don't know what it was. I just don't know if I'll ever know. Last summer, my boyfriend and I were camping in the uh, Iowa Cheetah Forest off the Winona Scenic Route. We drove through a gorgeous spillway to a creek site where we had set up our camp and were laying in the hammock for the night. Next thing I know, our dog is growling this deep growl I'd never heard her make, so it caught my attention. I look in the direction she's growling in, and I see this weird humanoid figure just casually walking in the woods about ten. 20 feet away from us. It's a light gray, maybe white color, 70 feet tall, very skinny, and has an abnormally large head. Our dog barks and catches its attention. It stops for a good 20 seconds, looks at us, then carries on its way. Needless to say, we immediately packed everything up and left. We hadn't taken anything recreational that night, though I sort of wish we had now. I don't know what I saw, but it scared the ass out of me, and I'm so curious if we were the only ones to see have ever seen anything like that out there. This was years ago in South Milwaukee. It was a winter day walking my dog. Overcast. I saw a dark creature sprint across the street, but it was. Not opaque. Like the edges were smoky. It seemed like it had legs, and I saw it sprint across the street and down an alley. It was maybe the size of a medium dog. Definitely seemed like it had four legs, maybe more. I did a double take, but couldn't find any trace of it. It was like it blipped into our dimension just for a few seconds. This sighting took place while I was on a fishing trip with my girlfriend, another couple, and their mom. My friends were staying at the resort cabins at one of my favorite fall fishing lakes. By the time we arrived, uh, delayed by wiring problems on my boat trailer, it was about 3 a.m. We talked until there was little reason to go to bed, just to have to get right back up to catch the morning bite. About an hour and... Ab, uh, half before sunrise, my friend Wes and I decided to go for a little walk down to one of the streams that feed out of the lake. I was curious to see what the fish were doing. We both had flashlights shining them into the stream as we walked along trying to spot fish. The further we went, the more uneasy I became, and I have been in these woods all of my life and never felt like this ever. I asked Wes if he felt kind of weird. He said kind of. We decided we'd head back. We moved to a different cabin closer to the lake. After the evening fish, I returned at late light, bummed about missing a very large brown trout. I spent most of the evening listening to fish jump and looking at stars. Wes' mom went to bed first, and about 11.45 p.m., the rest of us went to bed. My girlfriend and I were not sleeping in the cabin with Wes and his family. We were sleeping in the back of a full-size Chevy Suburban, mainly because Angela and I wanted a little privacy. Angela and didn't go right to sleep. This was about an hour and a half after everyone said goodnight at the campfire. I sat up to smoke a cigarette, and I was looking out the rear side window when something caught my eye. The cabins where we were staying are not very large. There was outdoor lighting attached to the middle of the roof line of the cabin. At first I thought it was the wind moving the tree branches or bushes, but something wasn't right. I then began to realize what I was seeing. I thought maybe I was a little more tired than I thought, and that my eyes were playing tricks on me. Except the trick didn't go away. Just to make sure, I asked Angela to sit up and look around and tell me what she sees. I totally expected to look stupid, 
and have her tell me she saw nothing. I did not tell her what I was seeing or where I was seeing it. I looked down at the floor. Angela sat up and it wasn't even two seconds before she visually locked onto the same thing I did. Still looking at the floor, I asked, What do you see? Her first word was Yeti and with that things now felt real. We both became excited, scared, and curious. I was a bit more uneasy with how the Bigfoot was moving and acting. It was about 50 feet away back in the tree line on the other side of the cabin, about 15 feet away from West Mom's truck. It was standing just out of the light so as not be directly seen. It was about seven, one and a half to eight feet tall, covered in hair, very broad in the shoulder and across the chest. It wasn't as bulky as what is in the Patterson film. What made me very uneasy was its movements and actions. It wasn't coming forward. It had one arm up above its head and to the side, resting on a tree. It was rapidly rocking from side to side and bobbing up and down. Angela made a statement about getting out to maybe get closer to it. I was in the process of telling her no. When the next surprise was realized, Angela points out that there's more than one. About two feet behind the tailgate of my friend's mom's truck was crouched not one, but two of what appeared to be smaller Bigfoots. They were crouched close together, sitting motionless and looking directly at us. They looked like they were younger ones compared to the big ones still rocking back and forth by the tree. They were not as broad in the shoulders or chest. Angela and I wondered what to do, quietly talking to each other for five or ten minutes. I decided to wake up Wes by yelling toward the window of his bedroom, which was in the middle of the back wall of the cabin. Wes answered back and I told him to look out his window. At first, he couldn't see anything through the window. I didn't tell him what to look for or what I was seeing for fear of him thinking we were pulling a joke or that we were totally out of our minds. As he opened the window, I asked him, Do you see it? His response was, Oh my God! Wes didn't say another word, which made me even more uneasy. I couldn't deal with it anymore. I jumped up to the front seat and was gonna start up the rig to back them off a little. When I got up front, I couldn't find the keys. I became a bit panicky. I found the keys and started up the Chevy with a big vroom, and it hardly seemed to bother them. I then decided if I was going to see Bigfoot, then by God, I'm gonna try to get a good look. I was parked in such a way that I had to pull way out and swing the front end around for my lights to hit them directly. As soon as the Chevy moved, they took off back into the trees and bushes. I then headed down the road toward a picnic era where they might cross a road. On the way, Angela said she had enough and didn't want to be around the Bigfoot anymore. I turned around, ended up taking a wrong turn finding, and myself driving cross-country through the cabins and the resort. I was turned around so badly I didn't know where I was. Angela spotted the cabin where we stayed the first night. I then began to drive out to the highway to leave because Angela didn't want to return until daylight. Just before I got to the highway, I remembered my friends at the cabin and the fact that they had their newborn baby with them. Angela agreed we couldn't leave them there, so we returned. Wes said that as we were driving off, something ran across the road behind us on two legs. Angela and I decided to leave the Chevy parked halfway blocking the road and go inside the cabin. After we got inside, I asked Wes if he'd seen what we saw, because I still could not take in the fact that this really happened. Wes told me he definitely saw what he believes to be a Bigfoot, he explained that he became salient because of the two smaller ones at the back of his mom's truck. After 20 minutes had gone by, I needed a smoke real bad, and Wes' mom wanted something to drink. Both were in my rig. Wes was the first to step outside. On the way back to the cabin, we heard a bunch of commotion down toward the lake, like something running through bushes, snapping and breaking limbs. We ran to the front door of the cabin. Just as we started up the steps, I fell onto the porch, scaring Wes to death. Once inside, we talked and tried to rationalize everything that had happened. Things were quiet outside from then on, other than the fact that a raccoon thumped on our door, which startled us. What was strange was that the raccoon seemed to want to come into the cabin.
The raccoon did not touch any of the food outside the cabin. I love camping. I try to go every summer. My family has a little cabin on Moxie Pond, right on the water. It's a couple hundred miles headed northwest and then about ten miles down the old logging roads to get to our spot. I love it. It's trees and water and no neighbors to be seen. It's quiet unless the dickhead across the pond is running his generator all damn day. There's no power. It's gas lights and stove. No plumbing, no running water other than what you pump from the lake using the old-fashioned hand pump over the sink. You do your business in the outhouse and throw some cedar shavings on it as a courtesy to the next person. My girlfriend have been together for about two years. She's more from the city, but she was excited to come with when I said I wanted to go up to camp this year. We couldn't go last year, so we packed our clothes and food and whatnot into my truck and started up. It's about a four-hour drive of about an hour and a half on the highway until you get to Shohagen, Skalvass it's occasionally called, and then it's another couple hours driving through tiny towns that are trapped in yesteryear and falling apart. The further you get from the paper mill, the worse it looks, but the better it smells. Driving by the paper mill smells like a wet skunk fart. You'll eventually get up into the mountains. The views are amazing. Sometimes some masshole will give you plenty of time to admire them as you're trapped behind their bumper as they creep along. You eventually get to the Forks. The Forks contains Barry's General Store, Whitewater Rafting Companies, and not much else. We got up there closer to the end of twilight, so there was nothing going on. No people out. You take right, drive to the dam at the end of the lake, take a left, and you're on the logging roads. You have to go kind of slow on the logging roads. I almost kissed a young moose one year when it jumped out right beside my truck, its nose almost coming through my open window. You're surrounded by nothing but trees. The forest is so thick you can't really see past the first trees. Especially at night, I've had some weird things happen up here over the years. I've heard a blood-curdling scream in the middle of the night that sounded like a girl getting murdered. The next day, I found a half-eaten rabbit floating in the lake. That put my mind at ease. A rabbit can scream, and it'll sound just like a little girl. I've heard singing in the woods, away from the direction of any other camp. It was a beautiful, mournful song, and I didn't understand the language. That's a different story, though. I digressed. We're driving down the logging roads, and I'm quietly laughing to myself as my girlfriend clutches my arm tightly, her eyes wide. She occasionally punches my leg when I don't stifle myself well enough. I don't blame her for being scared. She's never been in woods like this before. But I warned her, and it was her fault we got such a late start anyway. So we have to drive in at night. Once you get closer to the lake, the trails get smaller and more overgrown. Birch trees, bent over from years of snow and wind, scrape their branches over the top of the truck, occasionally blocking my vision. There's always maintenance to be done. I'm used to my eyes playing tricks on me. So I didn't think anything of seeing the shadows moving around us. I just wrote it off as being a trick of the light as the front of my truck bounced on the wretched road. My girlfriend would occasionally gasp and whimper and say, what the if is that? Finally, I just had her put her head in my lap, and I played with her hair as I drove, constantly telling myself that the figures and shapes I see are just trees and shadow. This isn't my first time doing this. I get a little turned around in the dark, but we get to camp, okay? I let her put her head back up, and I take her in my arms and comfort her before we get out telling her that nothing weird has ever happened up here. It's a lie, but I only have to get her out of the truck and into the camp. I grab my flashlight and get out and walk over to her door. I open it for her, grab her bag, and walk her into the camp. I get the gas going and turn the lights on, sit her down in the comfy chair, hand her her book, and go to get the rest of the stuff out of the truck. We're moved in, and I make us dinner while she reads. Safe inside. She's calmer now. 
but she did have me close the blinds to the double slider at the front of the camp. I was going to, anyway. During the day, it's a wonderful view of the lake, but at night, the fear is always at the back of my mind that I'm going to look out them and see something standing on the porch, looking in. We eat, we enjoy the privacy and each other, and we go to bed. We stay in the camp for a couple days. There's nothing that needs doing. We read, we swim. We F, we take the kayaks out and visit the islands. I tried to get her to just be naked while we're alone up here, but no luck. I brought a tent because I'd like to spend a night right out in the woods, but it's hard to convince her at first. But after a couple nights spent drinking by the fire without anything weird happening, she's more inclined to try it, as long as I bring my shotgun, which I was going to do anyway. I've never had an encounter with a bear or wolves up here, and we didn't hear any howling, but I'm not staying in the woods unarmed. It's the third or fourth night when we go out. We don't go far because I know better than to just wander off into the woods. We stay in sight of the big tree beside camp. We can't see the camp, we can't hear the water, but we find a nice flat spot in a small clearing, and I put the tent up. You can probably imagine how we then spent the rest of the day. We'd had hot dogs and s'mores over the fire that night, and then I put the fire out and we staggered to bed. She fell asleep quickly. I didn't sleep so well. I feel like I was in and out all night, more caught in the in-between world than actually asleep. I felt her get up and saw the muted light from her hand covering the flashlight, but I couldn't react or say anything. I'm not sure I didn't dream it. She went out, and after a minute, she came back in with the light off. She laid down and was out again. I still couldn't move, so again, I'm not sure I didn't dream her going out. My dreams are generally this not exciting, but I know I woke up when I heard her voice from outside the tent, her face on the other side of the fabric, a desperate and terrified whisper. You need to get out of there. That's not me. Get out. We need to get back inside the camp. My blood ran cold and my eyes opened. At least I think they were open. I couldn't see a thing. I sat up and went to reach for my shotgun, just in case. But I felt her hands wrap around me and gently pull me back down. She whispered, Where are you going? And I just froze. I let her pull me back down as my mind raced. My thoughts were like a broken mirror tumbling around in a dryer, smashing into each other and splintering even more. I said nothing. I just laid down and listened. My girlfriend still had her hands lightly across my chest, and she seemed to have fallen asleep again. I laid there in the dark, straining to hear anything other than her breathing. There was nothing. I had to chalk it up to dreaming. But I also had to look before I could go to sleep. I started to get up again, but again she pulled me down and got on top of me, aggressively kissing me. She didn't go to bed naked. She always wears pajamas. She wore some light blue pajama pants and one of my shirts to bed. But they're gone now, though. I wear nothing to bed, so it was easy for her to get what she was after. It's exceedingly rare for her to initiate. That's almost always been my job. She's always an eager participant, but I think this was maybe the third time in two years that she initiated herself. And she put herself on top, and she was aggressive. I'm not complaining about not having to do the work or the enthusiasm, but all three together is like finding a unicorn. A unicorn, as she did her thing. I eventually put what happened out of my mind and finally got my head in the game, thanking the alcohol. After we finished, she immediately got up and went outside. I figured she just had to pee, but she didn't bring a light. She never just gets up right after. We always just lay there for a while. She left the flap open. I'm sure because she was coming right back. I noticed I couldn't hear anything at all. Not that I was trying to hear her piss. I just figured that she wouldn't be concerned about it and go too far from the tent in the dark. After a couple minutes, I heard her footsteps returning. She came through the flap and was already on her way to laying down before her feet were inside. I followed the sound and caught her in my arms. She was dressed again. I was going to ask her why she left her clothes outside, but she was asleep by the time her head hit my chest. 
I kissed her forehead and rolled her off of me so I could zip up the tent flap. Then I laid down, absolutely exhausted, and at some point I fell asleep while listening to the absolutely nothing going on in the woods around us. I thought it strange, but I just figured it was because we were out here. The next morning I made pancakes and bacon over the fire for us. I mentioned the happenings last night, and she just looked at me quizzically. She couldn't remember any of it. She only remembered waking up to pee, taking the light, and then just going back to the tent and crashing again. She's not superstitious, so she just blamed the alcohol and was happy that she made me happy, and that was that. After breakfast, I started to break down the camp. I packed up some things for her to take back, pointed out the tree by camp, and sent her on her way. I watched her walk away for a minute because I just enjoy watching my girlfriend walking away. She disappeared into the woods, and I set about breaking the tent down and getting it packed up. It went slower than I would have liked. You have to get everything just right if it's going to fit in its respective bags again. After struggling for a bit and scratching my head, I became aware that I wasn't alone. I turned around and there was my girlfriend, just looking at me. In broad daylight, she was naked again. My eyes lit up and she giggled at my face, then crossed the distance to me without a word. She used the rolled up tent to kneel on for about 20 minutes, then just got up and walked off in the direction of camp. I'll admit, I was starting to have a hard time keeping up with her. Not that I was complaining, but I was feeling exhausted after every time. I finally got everything put away and went back to camp. I sat down and read for a little while before finally succumbing to a nap, sitting in the comfy chair in the sunlight, facing out the sliders. I woke up to my girlfriend getting touchy after me again. When we were done, I immediately passed out. I woke up sometime in the mid-afternoon to wind and rain. I'm not sure when. We don't have a clock at camp. My girlfriend had moved to the couch, reading. She was in just her underwear. I didn't know what prompted this change in dress code and appetite. I thought it was weird, but I was also happy about it. I started picking things up as we were leaving the next morning. I went in the bedroom to gather any clothes. Her blue pajama pants and my shirt weren't anywhere to be seen. I asked about them, and she said they were already packed. I went outside to take a leak. The winds were getting stronger now, and occasional fat raindrops would slap against my body. I could just barely hear my girlfriend calling my name, so I shook it off and went back inside to find out what she wanted. She was still sitting on the couch, reading. I asked if she was calling for me. She just looked up and shook her head. I reminded myself that sometimes my imagination gets the better of me and just put it out of my mind. That night, she didn't let me go right to sleep, but I crashed hard after. I woke up with a mild headache early in the morning. I had to pee again. I turned on my flashlight and covered it, leaving just a sliver of light. My girlfriend sat up and looked at me, so I turned the light towards her. Her eyes looked white and cloudy. I uncovered the light, and she blinked from the brightness, and her eyes were back to normal. She cursed me for blasting her in the face with a light and I apologized. I told her what I was doing and to just go back to sleep. She told me to hurry back. The storm had passed. I walked outside to the tree line. I shined the light through the trees while I relieved myself, just in case. The beam fell upon a patch of upset earth, all scratched and dug up. It wasn't far into the woods, so I walked over to it. Something had obviously gotten eaten. There was blood everywhere. I couldn't really make out any tracks. It just looked like there was a lot of thrashing and kicking involved. But it was weird that there wasn't a carcass. And it was weird it had happened so close to camp. If the body had been dragged off into the woods, I wasn't going to go looking for it. The next morning, we got ready to go and headed out. We talked about the weekend, but she seemed to have a spotty memory of it. I didn't think she had that much to drink. She kept herself entertained with me for most of the ride home. She'd never done that before, even when I asked for it. I was finally starting to think with the head attached to my shoulders. Her personality was different, at least when it came to sex. But aside from that, she still acted like she always had. I wasn't sure what to think. 
All she would say when I'd ask why she wasn't nearly as inhibited anymore was I got over it, delivered with a shrug and a smile. It's been a few months now, and her appetite is still high. I'm having a harder and harder time keeping up with her. I'm just getting tired more often. I've noticed I'm getting white hairs, and I just feel older. I'd talk to my doctor about it, but I can't afford that. I try to tell her I'm tired, but she always brings it out of me, and then I crash immediately after. And she always seems to have more and more energy. I don't know if I can keep doing this. I couldn't even write this in peace. Does anyone have any idea what's going on? I live in the Yukon, and by my house is a wilderness trail. Great trails leads to a bunch of lakes. I take my dog on the trails every day. Usually I have to walk him for at least two hours because he's part husky and has energy for days. Getting him to turn around any earlier than an hour is a nightmare. One day we're headed to the trails. Doesn't seem like anyone else is around. Seems quieter than usual. We're maybe ten minutes into our walk, and we're on a trail that is completely surrounded by trees. My ears popped for some reason, and it seems like the whole world's audio is turned off. Something also feels off. I look down, and my dog, who normally barks his ass off at all and any wild animal, is crouched down, hackles up completely silent, and just looks up at me with distinctly fear-filled eyes. We turn around, and he is pulling me back towards the house. He runs into my room and hides under the bed. He will not come out. He's under there for a few hours. When he did come out, he just sat staring out the window with his hackles up. He refused to go outside all night. Eventually, he got over it and relaxed, but even years later, he won't go down that one path. This happened circa 1971 or 1972 when my mother was about 14 or 15 years old. The incident occurred in a heavily wooded area near Monte Vallo, Alabama, close to Birmingham. My mother is the oldest of five children. She has three sisters and a brother who is the baby of the family. One weekend in the cooler months of the fall, my grandfather decided to take the whole family my grandmother, my mother, and all my aunts and uncles, so seven people total, into the woods for target practice with a rifle. My mother grew up quite poor, and they didn't always live in the best neighborhoods, so my grandfather wanted to teach the kids how to defend themselves with a rifle if need be. Like I said, it was later in the fall, so the trees were bare, and there were lots of leaves on the ground. The wooded area was just off a dirt road, so this was a fairly rural area they were in. Since it was so far off the beaten path, my grandfather became startled when he heard the roar of a car engine so deep in the woods. My mom remembers the car as being a blue Ford Galaxy. Despite the fact that my grandfather had a gun, he totally freaked out and told my grandma and the kids to hide under a pile of leaves in the woods. He hid with them. The man in the driver's seat got out, dragged a woman's body out of the car, and just dumped her there in the woods and drove away. After my grandfather was sure the man had gone, everyone came out of hiding and the woman sat up and stared them straight in the face. My grandfather asked the woman if she needed help. She said no, she would be fine. She didn't seem to be injured and obviously didn't want help. She hadn't put up a fight with the man when he was dragging her out of the car. She must have known him. Mm. So my grandfather cut the shooting lesson short and decided to rush the kids home to safety. Well, on the trail back to the dirt road where my grandfather had parked their car, they passed the man in the blue Ford Galaxy driving out of the woods. My mom looked over and noticed that he had a huge machete laying across the front seats right beside him. My grandfather made sure that the man could see that he was carrying a rifle but everyone was careful not to give away what they had just seen. The man struck up small talk with my grandfather, asked him how he was doing and what they were doing out in the woods. My grandfather explained that he had just taken his family out for some target practice with a rifle. The man told him to have a nice a day and continued driving. The next day, my grandfather went back out to that spot in the woods. 
There was not a body there. However, he did find the woman's wig, her purse, some Kleenex, and a pair of eyeglasses. He collected the items and took them home. According to my grandfather, that area of the woods was known for having shallow graves and being a dumping site for bodies. My mother became hysterical when he walked in the door carrying that stuff. She started screaming. He killed that lady. He killed that lady. My grandfather ended up taking the items to the police station, but my mom doesn't think anything ever came of it. She never heard anything else about it after that. Well, she did hear one other thing about it, I guess. Early the next morning, my grandmother called my mom when she arrived at work, just before the kids left for school. She told them not to take the bus that day, that she would come home and pick them up and drive them to school. When my mom asked why, my grandmother said, because that car is waiting for you at the bus stop. In the dense wilderness of Yosemite National Park, an unknown predator roamed free, having escaped from a secretive government facility. It moved with calculated stealth, blending seamlessly with the shadows of the towering trees. Its true nature remained shrouded in mystery, but its intentions were clear to hunt and conquer. Meanwhile, in a fog-laden coastal park, Ranger Ray carried out his duties with unwavering dedication. The tranquil beauty of the mist-filled landscape was disrupted by whispers, eerie voices that seemed to materialize from the ethereal veil. Ray's senses heightened as the whispers grew more menacing, echoing through the damp air. He knew he was no longer alone. Within the mist, an unseen predator lurked, its malevolent presence growing ever closer. Ray's heart raced as he navigated the treacherous trails, his footsteps muffled by the fog. Suddenly the creature pounced, its feral instincts taking hold. It bore an uncanny resemblance to a Sasquatch, but its eyes glowed a menacing shade of red. In a desperate bid for survival, Ray reached for his weapon, aiming to defend himself against the nightmarish assailant. A fierce struggle ensued, their bodies locked in a battle for dominance. Adrenaline surged through Ray's veins as he fought against the overwhelming force of the predator. With sheer determination, Ray managed to seize his gun, unleashing a volley of bullets at the beast. The creature collapsed, its lifeless body sinking into the damp earth. Relief washed over Ray as he caught his breath, believing the threat had been vanquished but his respite was short-lived. Moments later, a group of men dressed in black arrived, their presence enigmatic and foreboding. They swiftly collected the lifeless creature, showing no concern for Ray's well-belling. Before he could protest, darkness descended upon him as he succumbed to unconsciousness. When Ray awoke, he found himself disoriented and alone. The memory of the encounter remained vivid in his mind but the man in black and the enigmatic creature had vanished without a trace. Questions lingered, but Ray knew that the truth lay hidden in the depths of secrecy. Me and my pregnant wife were staying at my parents' house in northwest Tennessee on September 17, 2021. It is about 50 yards from our new house. I went out on their back patio to smoke a cigarette around 12 a.m. Over the fence, I heard something that sounds like it was choking on something, but at the same time sounded like a distorted pig squealing. It would make sounds in about two, three seconds spurts. I honestly thought it was a hawk or owl, anything that could be explained. I thought it was definitely weird, but probably natural. About three hours later, I couldn't sleep and decided I would go to the gym. As I'm walking to my car across the yard and towards the road, I hear this same weird sound coming from about 50 yards away at my 10 o'clock direction. I looked around and I couldn't see anything or hear anything. Then I hear, hey, hey, in a woman's voice coming from the same direction. So I looked back up and there was nothing there. As I'm scanning the yard, I hear that loud squealing noise again. I got in my car and dipped as fast as possible. 
I thought it was weird, but didn't give it a second thought until a month later I was on TikTok and saw a video of a man riding a horse in Arizona, I believe. And in the video, I heard a woman say, hey, hey, this makes him and the horse both freak out and run away. It was believed to be a skinwalker. When I heard that same voice and those same words, almost like a recording, my heart sank to my stomach. I really don't believe in any of this, and I've tried every way I can to disprove it, and I truly can't. It doesn't scare me as much anymore as it intrigues me. I am so, so curious to know what that was, and why me? This was last year in Bordeaux, France. I lived in a building that was going to be destroyed, so there were only like three apartments out of sixty with people in it, and they were far. From me in another branch of the building, I was sleeping in my room. It was during summer. Then I remember being woke up by something tapping on my window. When I looked at it, I saw something strange. I'm not native English speaker, so excuse me if it's difficult to explain. There was a shape, human-sized, I guess, moving on the balcony. It was like in the movie Predator, when the creature is in stealth mode. Or like in summer, when on a road you see heat coming out of the road, and your vision is a little bit blurry cause of that. At first, being half-sleeping, I thought, why the F did I put the radiator on? Every time I tried to close my eyes to go back to sleep, there was two distinct tapping sounds on one of the windows. Three different one. One I can see through, and two I can't cause of shutters. It was like something was messing with me, and it was every time I closed my eyes. Easy to spot cause I was sleeping facing the window and not far from it. As I told you, there was no one in this part of the building. I lived on the third floor, with no trees or thing in front that can cause such a sound. And he too tapping were every time at the same interval. I started to be really scared when I noticed that the shape was moving in order to tap on different windows. It was so disturbing that I couldn't move an inch. It was like this for quite a time. Maybe hours, can't tell, was too afraid to even take my phone. When the sun was rising, I probably felt asleep out of exhaustion. I will never forget this feeling of dread and pure fear when I saw this shape. My mom, brother, and I were driving over a highway overpass one night a few years back, and this big, black, hairless creature jumped over the side of the overpass, ran on all fours in front of our car and a few others, jumped over the dividing median but grabbed it with its front feet, ran in front of the other cars on the other side of the highway, then jumped down the other side of the overpass. This thing had really long, skinny front legs and very short back legs, was skinny, and when our headlights shone on it, it turned its head to look at the traffic coming towards it. Its face was creepily long, like a horse, almost, or a big deer. It was just weird and didn't look like anything my mom or I had ever seen before. This was like ten years ago, and I've been trying to come up with every idea of what it could have been. A manged black bear, some strange manged wolf, or black manged coyote or something, but nothing looks like it at all. The head, though, is what F's with me. It was much too big and long for the body. My mom and I saw it and slammed on the brakes like other drivers next to us. We were freaking out, trying to figure out what we just saw, while my brother in the back seat trying to figure out what happened, because he didn't see it, but saw everyone hitting thire brakes and slamming thire horn. This happened in Silverdale, Washington. There is a hike to the top of Pikes Peak that has a camp halfway up popular with tourists. It's a pretty tough 13 miles to the peak. I do a shorter hike that breaks off and shares the same trail that loops around. I often love doing the loop twice. On my first loop, about three miles from the trailhead, I come across a British couple who were very nice and looked like they were having a great time. 
They told me a little about themselves, and they asked me how much further was to the camp at the halfway point, and I told them it was about another three miles further up. They told me they were staying at the camp, and I found it a bit odd that they weren't carrying backpacks or supplies except for water. They thanked me and also told me, oh, and do mind that our luggage is coming up behind us. I thought to myself, luggage? On the way down, and I saw what they meant. About 1.5 miles from the trailhead, here was a young Indian man carrying two huge red luggages up the trail by himself. These were the types of luggages you see at hotels with tiny wheels and both looked extremely heavy. The only way this young man, who I presume to be their butler of sorts, can move the luggages up the trail was to lift up one at a time with both arms a few feet forward, set it down, and repeat with the other one. He looked pretty tired and he wasn't even nearly a quarter of the way to the camp. He was wearing regular street clothes, no sweater, and wearing flat converse shoes, which are awful for hiking. I spoke to him a little bit, and with his thick Indian accent, he also had questions about how long it was to the camp. He made a sad sigh when I said he still had about four one-half miles to go. It was around 5 p.m., and the sun was already starting to set and I let him know that it, at this pace, I wasn't sure if he'd make up there before dark. All he could say was, well, they're expecting their stuff to be up there, so I have to make it today. I wished him luck and went on my way. On my second loop around the shorter trail, I didn't come across the well-off British couple again. They must have continued on past where the trail splits. I did, however, come across the young man again, who, after about two hours, had only made about another mile of progress. He looked absolutely exhausted, and the wheels of the luggages were completely worn down to the base, so he had to continue carrying them up one at a time. It looked like his back was hurting, too. He again asked me how much further it was to the camp. To his dismay, I let him know that he still wasn't even halfway there. I asked him what he was going to do. He had no idea. He came to the conclusion that he'll probably just sleep by the side of the trail and then try to make it up in the morning. He asked me if I had any water that he can buy off of me. I had a spare Gatorade and he mentioned that he only had a $50 bill, but he was willing to give it to me. Seeing how desperate of a situation he was to offer so much for a drink and how tired he looked, I just gave it to him and told him to keep the money. I have no idea what happened afterwards, but that was one of the most weird things I've ever seen. This guy was totally unprepared for a hike like this. I felt super bad for him. I wonder how his night went what that British couple decided to do without their supplies making it up that night. I hope they eventually went back down to help him. I was backpacking alone at Mount Rainier. During the night, I saw three circular, flat-flying objects hovering like 100 feet in the sky, doing patterns. They would leave and come back, and it was all night from dusk until dawn. At one point, one hovered over my tent. I had the rain fly off, so I watched them through the mesh the entire night, frozen with fear. As soon as the sun rose, I shoved all of my gear into my pack and ran all the way back to my car. I drove to the ranger station to ask if they were testing any weird equipment. He said there was a military base nearby. Those things did not look like any drones I've ever seen, or anything that I can explain. The bummer is that I was alone in that entire wilderness area, and no one else got to see it. I was hiking and camping in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains with intent to summit some mountains the next few days. I make camp for the night and am just enjoying the evening when I hear a bunch of motorized equipment, four-wheelers and dirt bikes below me tearing up in the meadow. There are probably 20-20 people in this group. The route I came in didn't allow any motorized equipment, but oh well, what can you do anymore? So they start to make camp also and are boisterous and loud. I am certain there is a lot of alcohol being consumed. 
Not the experience I was planning to have, but I am moving on in the morning. Around 11 p.m., I'm trying to sleep in my tent and the party is still raging. Then the gunshots start. The drunks are just shooting wildly in all directions out of their camp to being the party to a whole other level. I'm about 400 feet away and they are shooting in my direction. There is a large boulder near my campsite, so I exit my tent and set my sleeping bag up on the other side of the boulder to avoid being struck by any stray bullets that might travel that far. I pack up and leave in the morning and encounter one of the group awake smoking a cigarette. He asked where I came from, and I indicated by pointing and said where you were shooting at last night. His reply was, oh, and I just walked away. I went back to that area about a month later, and all of their trash was left behind. Out of staters coming to Colorado and trashing it to have a good time on vacation is one of the reasons I left the state to live somewhere less popular for tourism and more wild. That will change someday, too. A couple years ago, when I was still in high school, my friend and I were walking along a long and lonesome road in southern Pennsylvania. We were bored as hell and looking for bottles alongside the road to smash against rocks and trees, just talking about nothing as we went along. Very few cars traveled that road, and for a long time we didn't see any, so we just walked in the road now and then. I don't remember when I noticed, but the entire world turned red. It was as if a red curtain was pulled in front of the sun and washed everything in a light crimson ting. It started as bad, and I'm glad he was there to confirm it, because I thought I was going crazy or having a stroke or something. When nothing happened for a while, we just kept walking, but I felt extremely on edge, like something was very wrong. Eventually, the red light faded after what felt like forever, but was probably 10 or 15 minutes. I have never seen or heard of anything like it before or since. I was with my friends at a cottage in the middle of the forest, secluded as F. We went there to, to party hard and spent three days being completely cray-faced. We had just as much hard alcohol as we had water. So this night, when it's after midnight, we decide to take a stroll to a nearby Jewish graveyard. We're in Czech Republic on German border. I don't know why there's cemetery over there. There is literally no civilization all around it. Well, so we set off. We have to follow a dirt trail through a very dense forest. With no other light source other than my camera's orange focusing light, which, surprise, barely illuminated anything. Needles to say we were S-faced. We barely walked. I had my German shepherd with me who kept running back and forth, making sure his herd of friends is safe. Fast forward to the cemetery. Nothing weird has happened. We poked around did some silly crap and then decided to return. Once we are going through the most claustrophobic area of the forest, I can hear a rustling in the bushes. Something moving very, very loudly. I use focus on my camera for the little orange light and see a figure. So I click the button to take a picture with a flash. Everyone screamed as we saw a person who yelled back gibberish and continued to walk towards us like a freaking zombie. We set off and run. My doggo, probably confused, starts to bark and runs with us. It's only that we stopped running that one of our friends yells back at us that we're idiots and that it's one of our buddies who got lost on the way to cemetery. Later he passed out, so we had to drag him back. I told the F that it wasn't the best idea to bring rum with him. Kinda upset at our mids later. What if we completely forgot about him? He had to have been alone for more than 30 minutes while barely conscious. I was walking my dog very early one morning, and I was the only person out at the time. It was winter, so it was quite cold, and the streets were icy. All of a sudden, from behind me, I heard this low, guttural, growling noise. I turned around and I saw way, way up the street behind me a man walking my way. 
I thought surely it couldn't be him making the noise as he seemed too far away. Anyway, I dismissed it and kept walking. A couple of minutes later, I heard it again. Only this time, it was right behind me. My dog starts freaking out, barking and trying to get it at whatever it was making this noise. This time, I didn't look behind me. I just started walking faster. The growls became louder and longer. It was the weirdest thing. It sounded like a cross between a demon and an animal. Anyway, I practically dragged my dog to our house and slammed the door. I ran to the window and looked out. There was nothing there. I told my husband. He just shrugged his shoulders and dismissed the whole thing. After it happened, I bought a vial of pepper spray. So one night I decided to go to sleep after a whopping three days of no sleep. But no, I have to get the spook of my life to keep me up the rest of the night. I was up late, around 2.30 a.m. or something like that, and I was ready to hit the hay. But before that, I was going to have nice ham and mayo sandwich. Leaning on an open window, looking out on the street, it was super empty. I live in a pretty scummy area, full of eshes. Australian gangster wannabes, walking around acting like they own the place, but no, they were nowhere to be seen. I went to go, wash my hands, and go to be, but just after I left the window, I hear a deep screech that came from outside. You'd expect me to say there was dark figure, wouldn't you? It absolutely wasn't. I looked outside the window to see this lanky creature which almost looked like it's glowing. I rubbed my eyes and it was still there. I thought that cliché would work. I saw it walking down the street with continuous screams and it was kind of pissing me off, not going to lie. So I leave the window and go to the front of my house to go get a proper look from my front balcony. Gone. The screeching stopped when I left the window. I honestly should have gone to check the window to see if it was gone. When it stopped that, but it, again, it was around 2.40 a.m. at this point. Weird thing is that those ashes haven't been around causing havoc for a while. They did come back the night after, but then they just stopped as well as the monster. I honestly wonder if it just me or if I actually saw something. I was probably just sleep deprived now that I think about it. The scariest part of it all is the fact that I've never had night terrors or even believe in the paranormal. But that was honestly something I thought no one, especially not myself, would have that experience. But I do believe in the phrase, everything has a reason, but with them both mixing together. It really doesn't make sense, but all I can do is tell you guys this to determine this. Just a heads up, this was 2020 when I was isolated, if that makes it any more convincing. After that whole experience, I was making the Uries in my head all night, which was keeping me up until the sun rose. I still hear the sounds of the screech in my head sometimes, but when I try to replicate them out loud, it doesn't really sound right, if that makes sense. I want to think that that monster, or whatever that was real, and I wasn't just seeing things, but who knows. I honestly too lazy to do my own research on it, so I, I thought you guys would know better than anyone since you're so woke. Do y'all know what the hell that was? It was four or five years ago, but the memory of that night still haunts me. My ex-boyfriend and I were driving through one of Georgia's national battlefields, once an Indian land, with a history of haunting stories. The stars were shining brightly that night, and we wanted to take advantage of the clear sky and peaceful atmosphere. We cruised along the empty roads, windows down, enjoying the night air. My ex decided to stop at one of the fields to capture the beauty of the Milky Way with his camera. I stayed in the car, gazing at the sky, lost in the vast expanse above me. Suddenly, from the corner of my right eye, I saw something white crawling towards the car. My heart skipped a beat, and my first thought was that it must be a ghost. After all, the battlefield was known for its haunted past. But as I looked more closely, I realized this was something entirely different. This creature had no face and moved with an unnatural gait. 
as if all of its bones were broken. The sight of it sent shivers down my spine, and I was paralyzed with fear, unable to react or call out to my ex. As he finished taking the picture and returned to the car, I mustered the courage to turn and fully face the creature. It had stopped making its way towards us, and as if sensing our attention, darted back into the woods. My ex, oblivious to what had just occurred, started the car, and we drove off, leaving the eerie encounter behind us. Ever since that night, I've believed that I came face to face with a skinwalker. The fact that it had no eyes made me question my conclusion, but the experience was too terrifying and unexplainable to be anything else. To this day, I can't shake the image of that faceless creature crawling towards us, and the memory of that night serves as a chilling reminder of the unknown lurking in the shadow. I had an eerie encounter during a solo hunting trip. I had successfully tagged out on the first day of a deer hunt, and with ten full days off work, I wasn't ready to return to the real world just yet. I decided to spend a few nights exploring new areas of the hunting unit for future seasons. I took a service road deep into the wilderness and found the perfect spot in a valley surrounded by towering peaks. I set up camp and then ventured out to scout the area for deer, just for fun. As I headed back to camp, I noticed something peculiar. Several of the trees surrounding my campsite were scarred with deep vertical marks. They looked like claw marks, but I couldn't tell if they were from a bear, a mountain lion, or even purposefully made by someone trying to fool people like me. I shrugged it off and settled in for the night. Being a light sleeper, any sound or disturbance could easily awaken me, and in the dead of night, that's precisely what happened. I was jolted awake by the most chilling sound I'd ever heard, a screaming banshee, like wail echoing through the valley. I lay there frozen in my sleeping bag as the eerie sound repeated several times, each scream sending shivers down my spine. I tried to rationalize the noise, telling myself it must be a distant animal or the wind howling through the trees. But deep down, I couldn't shake the feeling that something otherworldly was out there, haunting the valley. As morning broke, I packed up my camp, my nerves still on edge from the night before. I left the area, unable to shake the memory of the spine-chilling screams and the unexplained claw marks. To this day, the experience remains one of the most unsettling moments of my life. A reminder that there are still mysteries lurking in the wild, waiting to be discovered by the unsuspecting adventurer. I'm atheist, so, or I'm an abnormally lucky guy, or somebody is watching out for me. Not one, not two, not three, but four times I had this urgency to go to an open area. If I were claustrophobic, I would understand it, but I, when I got to this open area, not one single building around me and strong earthquake will hit the town. Puebla, 1998, 1999, and 2017, and Arizaba, 2015. Weird thing is, I don't live in those cities. Four times I've outran in Hurricane Category 5 by matter of hours. When I need something, I usually get it. You want to know how crazy it has become, this. Last year due pandemic. United States Consulate in Mexico stopped all working related to foreign visas without visa. I couldn't work on the United States. So I got dumped of that opportunity. Fast forward to September and another chance is hitting my doorbell. Better salary, better conditions, just plain better. But since I didn't cancel my visa appointment, I had preference during the few three or four weeks. The United States consulate worked before having to shut down again. Everything was just one day to do. One day wait to the interview, one day to get the visa. From there, I can go on and on about losing bus tickets only to later seeing that bus was wrecked or hijacked, only studying the topics of intest was so common my classmates were pending on what topics I ended up studying. 
Seriously, I'm a very lucky person. And before you ask, I had never lost on lotteries, scratches, and those kind of things. Never. I've never won big time, but never lost, and I got the feeling I shouldn't keep trying. I can't honestly explain from where such good luck comes, and I know statistics, and I know chances are almost always on our favor. But seriously, I just have so much luck that is just ridiculous. Living in a small town can often mean long drives to access shopping centers and entertainment venues. My ex-girlfriend, my daughter, and I decided to head to the nearest city about 25 miles away to spend a weekend browsing bookstores and enjoying a day out just like we used to do before my ex left in C-19 disrupted our life. The drive was familiar and uneventful taking us past a state park that we'd visited countless times before. However, on this particular day, something strange caught my eye, hovering about a hundred feet or so above the center of the road, just above the tree line, was a shiny metallic ball. Its presence was inexplicable, and I couldn't take my eyes off it as I tried to make sense of what I was seeing. My focus on the mysterious object meant that I was no longer paying attention to the road, and before I knew it, the car had veered too far to the side, causing the tires to make that unmistakable brar sound as they hit the grooves on the shoulder. My ex-girlfriend, clearly alarmed, shouted, Babe, urging me to correct our course and avoid an accident. I quickly straightened the car and asked her, Do you see that? She responded with a puzzled, what? When I looked up again to point out the strange metallic ball, it had completely vanished. It was as if it had never been there in the first place, and I was left questioning my own perception. We continued on our journey to the city, but the encounter with the mysterious object weighed heavily on my mind. I replayed the incident over and over in my head, trying to understand what I'd seen and why it had disappeared so suddenly. My ex-girlfriend and daughter remained skeptical, but I knew that what I had witnessed was not a figment of my imagination. To this day, I still have no explanation for the shiny metallic ball that appeared and vanished in the blink of an eye. The experience has left me with a sense of awe and curiosity, a reminder that there is always more to discover and that the world around us is filled with mysteries waiting to be explored. I'd like to start this by stating that I don't believe in the supernatural. But once, when I was 16, I was at a sleepover at a friend's house, and at about 3 a.m., I got up to get myself a cup of water. My bud was half asleep, but I asked if he wanted one too, which he just kind of did the mime sound to, and, and then turned to face away from the door in bed. I got out the door as the room was directly connected to the kitchen grabbed two cups and filled them. As I now had both my hands full, I tried to whisper for him to open the door as others in the house were asleep. I saw his hand crawl around the edge of the very slightly open door. The door started pulling into the room, but with closer inspection, the hand was completely blue, tinted with very yellow nails and way skinnier than hands of anyone in the house. I got into the room, not thinking too much of it, turned out. He was completely asleep, still turned away from the door. Didn't freak me out till the day after. My best friend of 16 years told me a story that I will never forget. This didn't happen directly to me, but it scared the shit out of me that I literally think about this tale once a week. This friend and I have been best buds since the first day of kindergarten. She's an atheist who has never believed in ghosts or anything paranormal. I used to tell her ghost stories all the time to try and mess with her, but she's all science. After she moved into this house, I think her beliefs have changed a bit. She and two other roommates and a cat moved into this old house in North Carolina that was notorious for being spooky and haunted. 
Weird things would happen all of the time. For example, her roommate was sitting on her bed once and her desktop computer mouse unplugged itself and literally flew across the room. The cat would be fine one minute, then look into a dark corner and hiss stand on her haunches, run and hide. They would hear noises, feel they were being watched. All typical haunted house stuff. One of the creepiest parts of this story isn't actually paranormal at all. This old, old woman, whose husband later told the group she had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, would frequently come to the house and knock on the door asking to see her mother. I suppose she lived in the neighborhood and would walk to the house and the husband, still with a clear mind, would have to drive and apologetically pick up his wife and take her home. The roommates would gently tell her that no one lives there except the three of them and she would usually leave, confused. One day my friend was home alone sitting on the couch watching TV. The back door was located behind the couch. Because of the TV, my friend didn't hear the back door open, but she sensed someone behind her. She turned around and that old woman was standing there calling out for her mother. My friend freaked and told the woman she had to leave and escorted her to the door. I guess the old woman stopped coming around after that. So fast forward a few months and the three roommates, two girls, one guy, decide to move out and go their separate ways, but the night before they moved out, they decided to wide you board the plate. I told my friend she's a idiot for doing this and apparently the little cop or whatever was flying around that board. Something came through. They asked it several questions. They asked if it was here alone and it said no. They asked if it was human, and it said no. And that was that. But it gets weirder. My friend told me she'd often be driving to work or her new apartment in the same town and would just end up at the house. Like she had no control or awareness of where she was driving, she would just go there. One time she said she even knocked and tried to move back in, without knowing why or where this impulse was coming from. This happened to her often. The three roommates later met up at a party and they discussed their time in the house. She told them about this weird habit she'd picked up and said they both turned white. Apparently all three of them had been doing this, driving to the house uncontrollably and not being able to explain why. At the same party after my friend and the other girl had left, this random chick approached the boy roommate having no knowledge of their past with the house, she said. I know this may sound weird, but I'm a medium, and you have three things attached to you. Do you know anyone close to you who has passed? The boy skeptically responded, Yes, I lost both of my parents a few years ago. Could it be them? The medium said two of the attachments could be your parents, but that third thing is something else. That third thing is dark, and it wants you back. Now we can argue she made this up to try and frighten me, but I can promise you I know when she's lying or trying to prank me. The specificity of this story is too legit, and she'd have no reason to make this up. I'm just really glad she never asked me to sleep over while she lived there. As you all know, it's Halloween, and my friends and I just had a really weird experience. We were sitting in the cemetery next to the host friend's house and smoking weed at around 9.39, 45 p.m. We were just messing around and having fun until we heard a super loud growl from the woods behind us. Like, not an animal growl, but... Not a man growl either, it sounded like Mongolian throat singing or something. I asked everyone, did you guys hear that? But nobody responded and one of my friends took off running. We all took off running after her. Even my friend whose legs give out on him a lot and would be in extreme pain every time he ran. So I know they weren't doing it tough with me. My one friend said he could hear someone running through the woods behind us and another friend heard what sounded like a man yelling after us. The neighborhood is full of extremely rich old people, and none of us think they would pull a prank like that, especially since it was pitch black and we had no flashlight, so you wouldn't just be able to casually see us in the cemetery unless you were looking on purpose. Any ideas on 
what the F just happened to us. On that day, July 17, 2017, I was relaxing at home in Santa Cruz, California, when I noticed some movement across the street from my kitchen window. It's a small side street with lots of large trees. It was hard to tell what I was seeing at first because they appeared to have some sort of camouflage, but they looked like black SWAT uniforms with small yellow lettering. Once I was able to get a better view, they were up in a tree, very well hidden by the leaves, and I was only really able to see them when they moved. It was apparent when they moved as opposed to the wind because only a small section of a branch would vibrate. I was startled and anxious because they were looking toward my house, and I first thought they had me under surveillance or something and couldn't understand what was going on. I watched them in the tree for at least five, ten minutes, and I was crouched low looking through a cutout in my fence. They seemed to spot me at some point, and some kind of faint beeping sound started, like an alarm on a radio or walkie. Talkie. They then began trying to slowly and secretly climb down ropes that I could see being controlled by a man high in the tree wearing a blue jacket. They dropped out of sight behind the neighbor across the street's fence. So this was all weird enough, but what happened next was absolutely mind-blowing. I was trying to see where they went behind the fence and noticed something very tall at the back of the driveway of their next-door neighbor. Their driveway extends behind their house into the backyard. I realized I was looking at an unbelievably tall woman with very blonde long hair. She had a sort of gray and white jumpsuit on with a strange looking oval back covering that went around the top of her head and all the way down to her feet. It was only solid in the back and was whitish in color with a patterned border around the edge. It didn't really look like fabric, but I couldn't tell what it was. Her eyes were extremely large. She stood very still, but moved slightly, and there seemed to be a shorter humanoid shape wearing the same color jumpsuit moving around rather wildly at her feet. But the shadow of the fence made it hard to see that part. The sunlight was good and bright, and the only obstruction was some sparse shadowing from tree leaves. Not really sure what I was looking at, I looked back to where the black-wearing tree climbers had been and saw that suddenly there was now a short, skin-colored something standing behind their fence. The fence is a lattice pattern, so there are a good many holes you can see through. It was too short to be seen over the top of the fence, but I could see a very large face with a deeply wrinkled forehead and eyes that almost looked like they were made of some kind of glitter. They were very large and somewhat rounder than what people usually describe as alien eyes. I could see that it was looking right at me, so not knowing what else to do, I waved at it. It then reached a hand with very long bony fingers through the fence lattice and waved back. It waved a couple more times, stopping in between waves. I was so stunned that I had to look away and shake my head to make sure I wasn't hallucinating. When I looked back, it had stopped waving and was a little farther back from the fence. It seemed like a good entity, whatever it was. Even though I was seeing from across the street through two fences, I could see it quite well. Things somehow got even weirder after that. I decided to lie down for a minute, glancing back to where the massive woman had been, but there didn't seem to be anyone there anymore. I went up into my little loft, which is several skylights under a giant live oak tree. I stared at the tree, trying to process what I had just witnessed, when I noticed a couple of branches quivering like the ones the covert ops guys had been shaking. I expected to see more of those creepy agents, but instead strained to see a much smaller creature climbing expertly up into the high branches. It was difficult to see it clearly because it seemed to be a dusty gray-green color, much like the bark and leaves of the tree. It seemed to have textured skin, possibly scaly, and it, it had angular face with teeny tiny little projections like little horns or possibly short antennae. It has a small mouth that looked full of sharp teeth. Its eyes were quite large and dark. It had a humanoid build but was short. 
I stared at this for many minutes, wondering what the hell was going on. Then I caught sight of some slight movement on other branches and saw two more of the same creatures climbing easily up the tall tree. They reached a high up branch that was big enough to lie on. The light, once they stopped moving much, was not ideal and it was hard to see them when they were sitting still. In the shade of the branches it looked like an even smaller dark green creature was working on the gray colored one's back somehow. It looked like a massage to me. I watched until my neck was too painful from looking up to continue. When I looked back a little later the branches were empty. This was all preceded by an unnerving experience late the night before. I got up to get water and glanced at the driveway neighbor's window. Inside, I saw an unnaturally gangly figure that was bluish light gray. It was staring out of their window directly at me, which caught me off guard, and I let out a little shriek. I walked from the kitchen into the bathroom and looked again, seeing that its eyes followed where I was. I called my boyfriend in fear and told him what I was seeing. He was just excited while I was scared. I thought that would be the end of it when I went to bed, but the next day was even crazier. I wish I had a way to find out what was going on. There was also a very small orb darting about the branches of the oak tree, and any time it would graze a twig, it would give a little shake. I've never seen a bird or bug or other flying life form move in that manner. I attest that this is all true, and I described it to the best of my knowledge. I've never seen anything like this before and really would like to know what was going on. And if it is real, why so many different kinds of extraterrestrials were in my neighborhood? Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.